Okay, so we will go ahead and start up. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 10.30 a.m. public portion of the closed session of the August 10th, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. If you would like to comment on a closed session item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. There is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely today. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council member Watkins? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Boulder is absent. Um, Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? I'm present. Thank you. I would now look to see if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to any items listed on the closed session agenda today. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. I'm looking, I see I have two attendees in the audience now, and I'm looking to see if either of those attendees are going to wish to speak on items listed on our closed agenda. You can press star, star nine, right? Is that right? Bonnie, star okay. nine, yeah. To raise, to raise our hand, yes. Yeah. Okay, I see caller ending in 3022. You'll be unmuted and you'll have two minutes. You should just be able to, you could press star six, try to unmute yourself. Good morning, this is David Cornblow on behalf of McKenna Court. Great, go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, thank you for the uh, We wanted to make certain that the council was aware McKenna Court does not allow any short-term rentals on its properties. It only has long-term leases, which expressly prohibit subletting or, short, or short-term rentals. McKenna Court was contacted by the city of a possible Airbnb rental and immediately contacted their tenants who, instead of responding to McKenna Court, vacated the premises and terminated the lease without any forwarding address. McKenna Court received no rents and no benefit of any short-term rental. In fact, Airbnb will not even provide McKenna Court with any information regarding any rentals at its property. No information about how many nights, if it actually rented, how much rent was paid, or even the name of the person on the account allegedly using McKenna Court's property as a rental. We understand that the city can enter into an agreement with Airbnb for all taxes to be collected by Airbnb and turned over to the city. McKenna Court does not have any ability to collect any such fees or even learn the amount of any rent collected. The transient occupancy tax should not be used to punish a landlord who doesn't allow for short-term rentals, who only has long-term leases and has no way to collect the tax if a tenant illegally uses the property as a rental. Again, here we have a, a landlord who's trying to and be a good citizen of the city and has no ability to protect itself. And we request that uh, McKenna Court be reimbursed for the taxes and penalties it has paid in the amount of $37,961. Thank you. Thank you. I see another um, caller named Katerina. Are you intending to speak today on the closed session items? Please raise your hand by pressing star nine. Go ahead, please. 
you press star six, you should be unmuted. Oh. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, no, please. I'm, I, I'm David Cornblue's associate. I was just sitting in. Thank you, though. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, we will go ahead and adjourn the meeting, and the council will now go into its closed session. Member Golder is absent. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. Um, actually, international and national award um, from the uh, Western chapter of the International Society of Arbor Culture. And I don't think it's Leslie here. Um, and I know Tony and Travis may have some comments as well. Um, just wanna, but I will start this off. Um, so today I would like to recognize Leslie Keedy, uh, who is the city's arborist, longtime city arborist, who has received board of commendation from the Western chapter of the International Society of Arbor Culture um, this year. The purpose of the award of commendation is to recognize an outstanding effort in promoting the purpose of the Western chapter of the International Society of Arboriculture, which is to foster a greater appreciation of the benefits and value provided by trees through promoting research and education in order to advance the professional practice of arboriculture. Leslie was recognized in a ceremony for her 20 plus year career with the city for overseeing the recent Cal Fire Urban Forestry Grant and the planting of 500 trees throughout the city of Santa Cruz. Leslie brings a collaborative approach to her work and regularly works with the public works planning and fire departments on tree related issues. Over the years, she has engaged numerous school and community groups in the planting and care of her trees. In fact, her downtown tree walk is one of the most popular annual events in Santa Cruz and was recently held just this past few weeks. Um, and again, it's very popular and is always a, a really enjoyable event to do to learn about all the amazing trees around um, Santa Cruz. We'll go ahead and hand this off to Tony Elliott and see if Tony has uh, additional words and just want to reach out um, myself um, to Leslie and just congratulate her. I've known Leslie for a long time. She just does amazing work and um, uh, she is so well regarded um, that I actually received many uh, emails in the past day from folks around the city who, and we also received a written uh, letter commendating um, just the work and the experience that every resident has with Leslie when they come, when she comes to look at their trees. So um, congratulations, congratulations, Leslie, on this award. And um, Tony, I don't know if you have additional, any additional um, comments. Thank you so much, Mayor. And I'm uh, actively texting Leslie here. I'm not seeing her on the call, but uh, uh, hopefully she, she can uh, see the very least. So. Um, now, we're very lucky to have Leslie within Parks and Recreation, but Mayor, I think you said it really well. Leslie is really a representative across the city uh, and is really a leader in many ways for the fire department and partnership with them, with the planning department, public works. All right, good, we got Leslie. There's Leslie. So, <laughs> good morning. <laughs> so we, we are very, yeah, very, very lucky to have Leslie on board. And I think a lot of this award, uh, as you said, Mayor, is really uh, geared toward the community engagement aspect, engaging the community and planting of 500 uh, trees. And uh, I have personally learned a lot from Leslie in, in planting, uh, you know, at least a couple of those trees. So her involvement with the community, again, it's uh, great as part of the, the service and, and brand in a way of Parks and Recreation, but far beyond that as well, the fire department, planning department, public works, and, uh, and just her continued uh, outreach with the public. So. We appreciate it. I know Leslie appreciates it, but um, uh, definitely want to send it over to uh, to Leslie if she has any words to share as well. Leslie, to, to put you on the spot here. You might have to press star six, Leslie, okay. if you have anything to say. Try star six. Mute yourself. There you so, go. 
Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay, hi there. So um, I'm Leslie Keedy. Thank you all very so much. Um, so this is the award. If you can see it, it's on Alderwood. And um, it was really a big surprise that I was even nominated by any of my peers. And you just come to work and you do what you do and um, you don't really feel that, you know, it, it's uh, above and beyond. But um, to get this award after everything I've been through over the last year with the CVE fires and everything is um, just a really great thing. And, um, you know, I do work a lot with the community. I love working with volunteers. And I think that's really what impressed the person who nominated me was he said very few city arborists actually get in with shovels um, on their hands and knees and dig and plant with um, seven-year-olds and uh, adults and everything. So um, it was just very impressed. He said not very many city arborists that he's ever even seen in the Western chapter actually are that hands-on with um, their types of efforts. And uh, this um, upcoming 21st of August, we're actually doing another tree planting with the Climate Action Group on the San Lorenzo River. We're installing 12 uh, Buckeye trees, which are California native. So um, I've invited um, the Santa Cruz Sentinel. We're doing a little media thing on that. So if any of you want to come and join that group, we have brownies and adults and um, all kinds of people coming to that planting as well. Um, but thank you so much for recognizing me um, at council level. Um, that always feels very good um, to feel appreciated. So thank you. That's enough. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. <laughs> Are there any council members that would like to say or recognize Leslie at all? We got a couple extra minutes here. I'm happy to, yeah, go ahead, Council Member Brown. I just wanted to say thank you to Leslie for all you do and how you do it. And, and I also wanna commend you and, and tell you that I'm, I'm quite impressed that in a community that has a very, very strong opinions about trees and tree health and um, how to address uh, heritage trees in particular, that you have been able to navigate that in a way that is just really amazing. And, you know, people just have nothing but respect for you. And so I wanted to, to call that out as well. Thanks for everything you do. Thank you, Leslie, and congratulations. And uh, hopefully we'll see you, some of us will see you on the 21st, so you around our trees in the city of Santa Cruz. Thanks again for everything you do. Well deserved. Okay, we will now move on to our next item. And this is a mayoral proclamation declaring August 19th as Jason Hydric Day in the city of Santa Cruz. Whereas Fire Chief Jason Hydrick began his public safety career as a state junior lifeguard and became a state lifeguard in 1990 while working simultaneously as a paramedic in Lake Tahoe until 1996. Afterward, he went on to become a paramedic field training officer in Santa Cruz County for Amer American Medical Response until 2002. And whereas Fire Chief Jason Hydrick began his firefighting career with the city of Santa Cruz in 1999 as a firefighter, quickly rising through the ranks to Captain Battalion, Battalion Chief, Division Chief, and Fire Marshal, and was ultimately named Fire Chief in 2019. During this time, he was the first fire captain assigned to the Marine Safety Division, where he expanded and developed many of the ocean rescue practices that are now used today. And whereas a, as a Division Chief and the Fire Chief Jason Hydrick led the efforts to reestablish the Santa Cruz County Fire Investigations Task Force, which has been instrumental in the arrest and successful first prosecution of numerous arson suspects. And whereas Fire Chief Jason Hydrick has responded to a variety of major incidents throughout the state, leading strike teams on major campaign fires and heading numerous overhead positions in incident management teams, including the Gilroy Garlic Festival shooting in 2019 and the CZU Lightning Complex fire of 2020. And whereas Fire Chief Jason, Jason Hydrick has been a leader in the firefighting profession, a valued and respected colleague in the city of Santa Cruz and dedicated and many of his contributions will be impactable, impactable both for the fire service and the Santa Cruz community for years to come. And whereas Fire Chief Jason Hydrick has been a consummate professional who enhanced the capabilities of every city department, 
He undertook understanding and managing the city's response to COVID-19 during a time of great uncertainty and fear, while also leading the city through the unprecedented threats of the CZU lightning complex fire, breaking down the silos between police and fire by leveraging the strength of each department to improve the capability of the public safety function throughout his tenure, whereas through hundreds of emergency crises, fires, natural disasters, and a worldwide pandemic, Fire Chief Jason Hydrick has led the Santa Cruz Fire Department with a steady, calm, and dependable manner. His good nature, passion for public safety, and commitment to the people of this community has been a reassuring force in Santa Cruz County for over 22 years. And whereas on August 19th, 2021, Fire Chief Jason Hyde is retiring after 22 years of faithful and selfless dedicated service to the city of Santa Cruz and its residents. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim August 19th, 2021, as Jason Hudrick Day in the city of Santa Cruz, encourage all citizens and his coworkers to join me in expressing heartfelt appreciation for his 22 years of dedicated and exemplary service to the Santa Cruz City Fire Department and the city of Santa Cruz and wishing him the very best in his retirement. And Jason, I think it's hard, it was hard to get through that without a little tear and a little, little, uh, little something in my throat. Um, you, we're, you are a big loss for our community, and um, but we absolutely understand your desires to live your life and, you know, look forward to seeing you around town. And um, you've been through a lot in the last few years. And um, I also just want to recognize that uh, you helped us win the uh, Aloha Outrigger races. I wanted to put that in the proclamation, but he was definitely a critical part of the team. So again, the 2019 team will go down and so uh, we'll see how uh, see if we can get you back down here for that. But congratulations, Jason. Well, uh, well celebrated, and um, happy to hear some words from you. And I'm sure Council would also like to say um, words as 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 uh, as folks would like to. So, Chief Hyde. Well, well, thank you, Mayor and City Council. Um, it's been a interesting ride. Um, and go for the. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to uh, have been part of this. And I may be getting recognized now, but I really have to say that all of those things would not have happened without the men and women uh, in the department, within the city. Um, it, it, it truly is a group effort. And I look back to all those people who had input into uh, what I've done, who supported me and those who will come after me and I have full faith in them. And so um, I, I feel like I'm being recognized um, for the work that um, people do on a daily and nightly basis, uh, whether it's a fire, a medical, a water rescue, working with uh, Parks and Rec, working with Public Works, working with the Water Department, working with the Police Department. Um, I, I, I feel like I'm being recognized for the work of a lot of other people. Um, and I just wanna make sure that uh, they're recognized as well. The Fire Department is a collective uh, very much so. Very happy for what I've been allowed to participate in. I hope I've made a difference and thank you. Um, it, it's, it's been good. And I'm working on a, uh, uh, I don't wanna call him a ringer, but uh, a, a good replacement for paddling and hopefully 21 uh, is a success of 2019. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Council members, anyone wish to, yeah, go ahead, Council Member Watkins. I just wanted to say, um, you know, thank you, Jason, for your years of service. I really enjoyed working with you. I feel really honored to have worked with you, um, especially my year as mayor, and just really want to say how I've learned from you in terms of your leadership and your approach to commitment to public safety um, with humanity and humility and compassion. Um, really, truly outstanding. And I know that you have dedicated so much of your life to this community, and I wish you and your family the absolute best in your journey into retirement. Council Member Kong. Thank you, Jason, for all your work. Um, I have only gotten to work with you this last year, um, just informally, and I've been so just, um, impressed and taken back by your commitment to the community, your responsiveness to um, every level of community concern, um, and 
attention you put behind everything that you do. So thank you so much. Um, I hope that we cross paths in our community and I'm, I'm sure you'll stay active and um, I wish you all the luck. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Uh, yeah, Chief Heiduk, I just wanted to add um, that I really appreciate your, not only your responsiveness, but the way that you approach dealing with really chronic challenges and some acute challenges um, in disaster moments, but the ongoing challenges that um, we face in our community and, and doing that with such um, clear intention and communication and, um, you know, I just, can't say enough, I'm in a bit of denial that you are leaving. So <laughs> I guess it's happening now. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you for everything. And um, we hope to see you out and about. And uh, I hope you find a ringer for that team. That sounds great. Thank you. Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll just add on to what people are saying, just express my gratitude for the commitment to the community and and um, and also just um, you know, getting to know you over the past few years and understand the community. It was really good to see um, your leadership shine through, especially last year when, um, as mayor and um, for many of us on council, we were going through the CZU fires to really see a calm and steady approach as to how the city's what the city's role was during that and also during the recovery. It was um, just really impressive to to be able to work with you and and see how city was able to respond during a time of crisis. So really want to thank you for everything you'd, you've done over the years, but you know, in particular during um, such a really critical time, um, your role as, as a leader in our community. And um, and and yeah, I uh, look forward to hopefully seeing you more over the years and, and uh, hopefully we can reach out to you if we ever need your advice. Thing. And Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jason. As, as a new council member, uh, already within the first, the beginning of onboarding, you reached out and you were just a wealth of knowledge and information. And it was clear that you deeply cared and had a commitment to our city, to our community, and to public safety. Thank you so much. I wish you the best with your family and please keep in touch. Thank you. And City Manager Martine Bernal. Uh, thank you. Um, I also wanted to just uh, really thank Jason for his uh, years of service and, and his, his leadership. And just to highlight that beyond his uh, leadership in, in the fire service and his, in his profession, he's been really been a critical leader also overall in the city's executive uh, and leadership team. Um, and he'll be greatly missed uh, by his uh, colleagues on the team. Um, because he really has taken uh, a role in leading the city, not just in, in fire, but in all the issues that are critical to the city. Um, he will be greatly missed, and I'm, I'm really sorry to see him go. Um, but uh, he's just a, a, a professional and a leader of the highest caliber, and we've been so lucky to have him. So thank you, Jason. Thank you, Martin. Great. Well, Jason, I know there's a celebration for you, I believe next week, I think it's on the 18th at two o'clock at the fire department. And I know many of us will definitely be there to um, celebrate you and um, you're just gonna be greatly missed here. So thank you for all your work and uh, we'll, we'll get as much out of you in the next uh, eight days that we can. <laughs> We're lucky there's a red tide, otherwise we'll get it, we'd get out there and jump off that wharf again. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Jason, for all your work. Appreciate it. We'll now move on to uh, our next uh, scheduled item. Um, next is the, um, a, a few announcements I'd like to, ha to share uh, with those who are listening today. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. 
Please note, public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comments during today's city council meeting are numbers eight through 31 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, uh, regarding agenda item 19, uh, and that is updates to the downtown parking resolution. I just wanted to say, although the downtown association receives no funding from parking fees, I will be recusing myself from item 19 out of caution due to my employment with the downtown association of Santa Cruz. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Are there any other statements of disqualification today? I'm not seeing any others. Okay, I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions or and deletions to the uh, to the agenda today. Fair enough. Thank you. Next, uh, just a quick announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately or after agenda item 31 today. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications and towards the, item, the, towards the end of item 31. I'd now like to ask the city attorney to report on closed session. Yes, uh, good morning, Mayor Myers, members of the city council. This morning, the city council met in closed session uh, at 10.30 a.m. to discuss the following items. I don't have a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims. Uh, those are the claims of Farmers Insurance, Lynn Gallagher, and McKenna Court LLC. Those items are also listed as uh, number 15 on your consent calendar this afternoon. Item two was real property negotiations involving the city owned property uh, at the Poganip and negotiation uh, concerning the price terms of payment or both for a, a proposed lease with the homeless garden project. And um, that item was deferred until the second closed session, uh, which is scheduled to begin on or about 4.30 this afternoon uh, with the other items that are listed on agenda for the afternoon calendar. There was no uh, reportable action. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. Next uh, is item number five on our agenda, which is the city manager report. And I'll go ahead and turn this over to Martin Bernal, our city manager. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. We have uh, three updates to provide to you today, um, and they are a, a fire uh, status, uh, and uh, the second is on water uh, supply and the drought, and then an update on the Black Lives Matter uh, mural vandalism. Um, so we'll start with, uh, we'll have the pleasure of, of hearing from Jason again. Uh, regarding uh, our fire uh, situation and then move on to water and the Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Mayor and City Council. So, our is increasing and we're no different than other areas in the state. And I know that um, we've, we've, we're having some really significant fire behavior in the state. Um, but I wanna emphasize that we have different conditions here locally than those areas. Um, as many of you are aware, every morning it's been fairly drippy. Um, we've had that fog that's come in, which has helped with some of that moisture to capture. So our risk relative compared to what you're seeing at the Dixie fire, and uh, we have crews that are there, um, but we're dry. And that lack of precipitation um, is going to increase the risk of a fire starting, but more importantly, of a fire starting and spreading rapidly. Um, so we need to be really conscious and aware of what our actions are and how we go about um, you know, limiting those risks. Um, our vegetation management is uh, moving forward within the city. Uh, we've done significant work in our open spaces, putting in fuel breaks, removing uh, that fuel, but also providing those barriers so it doesn't spread um, you know, quickly and allows us to suppress it. 
We've also been very successful in eliminating those known ignition sources within our open spaces, specifically Poganip and Sycamore Grove, which is our largest continuous fuel source within city limits. Um, and that's going to, going to be ongoing work that we're doing. Um, I'm also happy to say that our efforts for outreach um, and, and prevention within the Firewise community um, is paying dividends. Um, I, I don't know if you're aware of what the Highland Group did within the GOAT funding, um, but those efforts are the culmination of years of outreach and work and getting the neighborhoods engaged and uh, Prospect Heights is doing that. We hope to foster that and encourage that. People being prepared is what we want. Hardening their home, the impact of a fire um, is what we want within our neighborhoods in addition to trying to prevent the spread within the vegetation management and limiting the ignition sources. Um, the state as a whole is, is very dry because of that. Um, and so uh, we're getting into our highest risk of, of the year um, when we get into August, September, October until we start getting uh, persistent uh, rainfall. Um, and I know that um, Rosemary uh, from the water department to give an update on water, and we're very much um, connected to that. So our fire danger is, is elevated compared to what it is in other times of the year and from years past, um, but locally here within the city because of our weather patterns, um, we've made it, we're, we're moderating that risk. And so we're uh, continuing on all efforts. Um, I equate it to, you know, when you're driving a car, you wear a seatbelt and have it have an airbag. It's not one of the that prevention, limiting those ignitions, and trying to prepare the community as a whole. And so I would uh, ask that everyone uh, go to our website. We have a disaster preparedness uh, flyer that you can um, come up with a plan for you and your family and your loved ones. And we also have information for what you can do to uh, not start a fire, but also not suffer the consequence of a fire for a wild land. And so that's an on effort uh, that's going to continue on long after I'm gone. Um, and so. I would say don't be afraid, but be prepared. That's the message that we want people to, to take from this. Any questions from council for Chief Hardwick? Not seeing it. Thank you, Chief. Martin? Yep, next we'll have uh, Rosemary Menard do an update on the drought and uh, water supply conditions. Good morning, members of the council, Mayor Myers, Vice Mayor Bruner. Um, thanks for this opportunity to give you a quick update. I'm gonna uh, share my screen, at least hopefully I'm gonna do that and uh, have a little bit of a slideshow for you. Um, so what I wanna just cover today is a quick update on the status of uh, where things are with water supply. And um, fundamentally the, the story is uh, not that great. Um, we, uh, Loch Lomond Reservoir is down 23 feet below full. We've gone down, it, we didn't fill this last winter, so it's, it wasn't full to begin with, but we've gone down you know, 10 feet in the, since the, the spring, and fundamentally, the, this is our main source of water supply right now. Uh, daily demand is running about seven and a half million gallons, which is a little bit less than last year, which is good. Um, it's pretty much that's the kind of you know indoor use and some irrigation use, but not that much is what what we've got going on with respect to um, that 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 uh, demand level. Um, and then we have a situation where we do have a stage one uh, water shortage emergency in place. And we know that the allocations are much lower than they were in 2014 and 2015 when the last time we did allocations for customers. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But fundamentally, our demand is so um, efficient already that about 30% of our residential customers are really struggling to try to reduce their consumption to stay within their allocation. And this is a, a really important issue that um, you know we need to be talking about here, not because I think people need to be doing more, because I think the level of efficiency that people have achieved is really excellent. I think it's that how much more is there available from that particular source. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And I think the, the key thing for me is that the projections that have just come out in the last couple of weeks with respect to a potential another, an additional La Nina winter, 
which could bring us, uh, you know, sort of very dry conditions such as we saw in this last winter, and that would be quite, um, quite challenging for us. Um, so the next slide is hopefully, oh, why can't I find the, there we go. Um, so this is a, a, something that you saw earlier in April when we brought you a, uh, a projection elevation it was starting at about 71%, 72% and going down to about 58%. That was our projection. We've actually seen uh, quite a bit accelerated uh, use on this, uh, on our facility, partly because the dry conditions and also stream flows have not been as available for us to use for, you know, water supply from our flowing sources. So that has made uh, Loch Lomond a uh, reservoir the focus of what we've uh, really been focusing, what we're, what we have to use, and the updated projection is that we'll end the the, uh, rest said the, of the year, the water year, kind of at the end of October yeah, for us, not, the dry season well, period, at about 56 percent, 56 and a half percent. That's we've done pretty well. That's okay. you know only about 15 yeah, percent uh, down from where we started. The but the fact that we weren't full really makes this uh, kind of a position going into next year. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, here shortly. So I wanted to, this is a, a graph that has a lot of um, numbers and figures on it, but I wanted to show you some patterns because one of the things I've been doing is I've been really looking at uh, the difference between uh, critically dry years and, uh, and and this is a, the, the one you see here, the 2020, it's a dry year at about 33,000 acre feet of cumulative discharge from the San Lorenzo River system. And then all these others that are here and these little patterns are uh, from critically dry years with 1977 being our worst on record. You can see they kind of bunch up here in, in some ways with uh, 2014, 2015 being at about 14,000 acre feet of uh, cumulative discharge. Um, the, these numbers here from 88 and 90 being at about 20,000 acre feet. These numbers here being at about 25,000 acre feet. And here we are at 2021 kind of running just over 15,000 acre feet. So we're not going to be quite as dry as 76 or 2014, but definitely are in a challenging situation. And I, I show you this because I've chosen some of these uh, these years to sort of do a forecast into the future. I'm going to show you on the next slide. And so I've, I've chosen them from these kind of sets here, if you will, one from 2014, 1989, uh, I think, 1977, and a 2020 to say, if we started a little bit lower than I think we'll, we'll project ourselves to start and ran this exact same uh, forecast going forward, what does it look like next year if we have another critically dry year? And that's what is shown on this graph. This is our uh, percent full for the reservoir. The, the sort of gray shaded box here is what traditionally has been our sort of reserve that we like to carry over, our insurance policy of about a billion gallons to carry over from one year to the next uh, in case we have another dry year. And what you can see is if we take those projections that I just showed you from the various those various water years and we, you know, forecast them going forward, we dip into the sort of reserve level pretty significantly with a 77 obviously down to 10%. These are about two, a 10% is about 280 million gallons. So you can sort of get a sense here. Um, and this is what we're looking at. And these are projections. And these aren't, there's not even a high probability that any of this would happen. It's really us looking forward and sort of saying, what if, and how do we get ready if we have something that is going to challenge our ability to maintain water service to our customers and to um, our community in an, after another dry year. So this is sort of scenario planning we're working on. Uh, you can sort of see that an 89 year, this purpley line here, uh, things get better actually because we're getting that's a that's about 25,000 acre foot um, it's nowhere near normal in 2017 the the cumulative discharge of the San Lorenzo River was 300,000 acre feet so it's still pretty darn dry but it it improves the conditions quite a bit just by a little bit more precip 
So these are, again, they're not projections. I can't even tell you the probability that any of this would happen, but it's us using this kind of information to think about what about next year, which is the key. So improving the picture, that's what it's all about for us at this moment. And, you know, I, I'm gonna date myself with this, but growing up in the 1950s, uh, we had an old black and white television and there really wasn't many knobs or dials that you could turn. You didn't have 100 channels, you, you know, you had three or four. You, if you wanted to improve the picture, you played with the rabbit ears. Uh, you could turn the volume up or down, that was pretty much it. And really the water system is kind of like that. We have a relatively few number of things that we can do to sort of improve the picture. And um, one is reducing demand, I'm gonna talk a minute about that. Another one is modifying the system operation to achieve admittedly marginal improvements, but you know we try to do what we, we have to do. We can do turn every knob and dial that we can. And then last one is bringing on some new supply. And you know that's, that's a good thing to think. It's not so easy to do on a quick turnaround, but we certainly are pulling out all the stops and looking at the options because some of those projections, or, or, you know, those, those uh, scenarios I just showed you, they're not too attractive. So we're basically looking at all of this. And, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, reducing demand sort of next. Um, I know the council received a, a letter from Ron Pomerantz about an item that's on the consent agenda a little bit. And uh, I had a chance to talk with him yesterday about um, kind of some thinking that is uh, a little bit updated on you know what he'd been used to. His his assumption about that was built into his comment about stage one not being a very serious situation is based on the old water shortage contingency plan. And I information about this is a stage two in the old plan. Stage one actually didn't really have any real reductions, but stage two had a 15% reduction. All these numbers are for the different categories, but the bottom line is it was to bring demand down to 2.1 billion gallons. And in their stage three plan, which is what we used in 20, uh, 2014 and 2015, where we did actual rationing, it was to bring demand down to 1,800, 1 1.8 billion gallons. The water shortage contingency plan that we that council adopted in uh, February this year the stage one reduction is a 10% reduction and it's to bring water demand down to 1.2 billion gallons. And a stage two is just over a billion gallons. So you, water consumption, and if you look at all these, you know, what's the amount that is in, how much the single family is using, the significant reductions that have already occurred among customers to improve the efficiency, the long-term efficiency of how they're using water. Basically, every case here, 40, 50% reductions on the total demands that, that um, customers are using. So when I talk about adjusting, uh, you know, further adjustments to reduce customer demand, and when I talk about the fact that 30% of our customers are struggling with meeting the allocations, this is why there's not much more that you can get from uh, these kinds of measures, even putting a stage two allocation in with a, you know, with penalties, there's a limit to what can happen there. So that's just a part of the reality. Um, the other piece that we're doing, and I mentioned that we can do some changes, some operational changes. We certainly are bringing all of our sources that are online uh, we, we're making some changes to the fish flow releases uh, that are marginal, but it's trying to improve our conditions going forward as best we can this year. And then really we are turning our attention, not that our plates aren't already full, but we're turning our attention to term supply augmentation strategies and looking at uh, you know things like emergency repair of the Majors Creek pipeline. It's been out of service since a failure in 2019. And the reason it's been out of service that long is it's in extremely difficult terrain. So the repair is not only expensive, it's extremely difficult. Um, another option that we've already been working on and we've reported some 
over time and certainly been very engaged with the Water Commission on this topic is aqua storage and recovery. And we think we have the possibility of actually implementing aqua storage and recovery in our belts wells eight and 12 this coming uh, winter, which would give us the ability to take more water out of groundwater next summer to help improve supply situation. So these two measures and others are, you know, being uh, worked on and we're at the point now where um, I think that's it. We, um, you know, all we can do is wait it out and sort of see what actually happens uh, because the weather part is not something we're in control of. So happy to take your questions. Are there any questions from council members for Rosemary? Council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you for that um, update, Rosemary. Uh, you mentioned there were three things that we're looking at to improve the picture, and it was reduce the demand, modifying system operations, and bringing on new supply online. Do you have examples of what bringing the new supply online looks like? Was yeah, that that's aquifer? the aquifer storage and recovery and the, you know, fix the majors pipeline. It's, it's majors has been a part of our system historically, hasn't been a very big part, but right now we don't have access to it because we don't have a pipeline from its diversion to the uh, North Coast pipeline. And they're talking about some kind of emergency repair, which would be sort of temporary, but would potentially get us access to that water um, in the, now and then over the winter potentially and into the you know next year okay thank you um i had a question uh rosemary on the um the fish the fish releases the flow releases for for the steelhead right um, and coho um is still mostly happening i assume in the river San as a river or are you also looking are you working with those flows up on the north coast stream not the North, there's not really enough water in the North Coast stream to make a difference uh, up there at this point, but we definitely are looking at the Tate diversion. Um, there's an exception year flow where we can reduce from eight CFS to three CFS. So we're certainly trying to do that. There are a couple of issues there having to do with the river is so down at this point that getting the extra water to divert into our intake is a little challenging from a hydraulic perspective, but we're working on that. And then there's also a flow release from uh, Newell Creek Dam that we're uh, in the process of putting together what's called a temporary urgency change petition that would reduce that flow um, a bit and allow the reservoir to maintain that storage rather than putting it into Newell Creek which then comes down, you know, to the lower part of the system. Okay, great. Well, let's hope it starts raining in California soon. Yes. <laughs> it's a pivotal year for sure. Yes. Um, okay, not seeing any other council questions. Um, thank you, Rosemary. And um, I guess I had one other question. Um, I believe there was also some emails that came in just about, um, drought awareness and it, it, I mean, we continue to do those communications and right. on those, those right. items. Right. So the comment I would make on that um, is that it, unfortunately it's characterized a little bit more broadly than maybe is actually being experienced, but there is a lot of one-on-one -on -one and you know, the, the level of communication isn't happening by bus signs and you know, bill inserts getting produced and delivered as much as it is in the interactions with individual customers and as they're looking at how to, um, you know, mat, try to manage their water use, um, looking, you know, putting together packages that people can, you know, we have a little um, put your order in and then pick up kind of thing, you know, uh, distribution thing going on for water efficient devices. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of work going on uh, and working up, uh, you know, online informational uh, thing like a water school kind of application that's going on that could potentially be used even outside of the water school opportunity to help people understand what those, you know, what the situation is and what the, and so all of that is in, is really what the additional funds that that are part of the plan that was actually put together and for the implementation, but we're split because of the two fiscal years. And has there have the have the, uh, have the hotels and and all the 
you know, lodging, have they been pretty responsive in terms of, you know, notifying, you know, you know, visitors and all that? I right. Mean, yeah. Okay. So, so the interesting thing is because of the COVID impact on, um, on business consumption over the last couple of years, the business consumption was lower than what their allocation would have been uh, from the, uh, you know, from the stage one reductions. So ma imagine that they're, um, that they're, they're like 20 or 30 percent below what they would have been asked to reduce to in the, because they were so far down. So we've seen some increase in business use, you know, between June and July, for example, but they're still below what their allocation would have been. So we haven't asked them to do, you know, the kind of thing like in Mendocino, where they're asking customers, that particularly, you know, visitors to come in to conserve. We just aren't seeing uh, that kind of demand from that sector. So, and of course, you know, there's a similar kind of thing going on in many of the other sort of sectors where, you know, there aren't so many people in town. We'll start to see something change when the university students start coming into town here next month. But at the moment, you know, things are pretty, um, sort of stable in those. So the big focus is on residential at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Rosemary. Um, next, uh, Martine, I believe you were gonna give an update on um, the Black Lives, Mural, Black Lives Matter mural. Yes, yes. Yeah. And yes, I'm gonna have actually uh, Kathy Mintz do an update on the uh, discussions around the uh, repairs and then um, Bernie's got uh, an update on the uh, criminal uh, aspects of the uh, uh, vandalism. So I'll turn it over to Kat. Kat. Okay. Well, Thank you, Martine and Mayor Myers and council members. To set some context for this update, when the Black Lives Matter mural was installed in Santa Cruz in 2019, the mural organizers envisioned the artwork as a vehicle for activism, accountability, and policy change for Santa Cruz and beyond. And that would be Mustafa, one of the lead artists. Since the original installation, activists have formed into the Santa Cruz Equity Collaborative with the Yoga for All movement serving as the fiscal agent. And since the acts of early, the early evening of July 23rd that we're addressing now, the Equity Collaborative has been working closely with the attorney's office to one, tally the costs related to installation, restoration, of the mural. The initial estimate was approximately $22,000, but that's been updated with additional costs over this time. And second, they've been working with the district attorney's office to convey the impacts of that aggression that has been felt by the community. The equity collaborative wants to wait for the outcome of the legal, find an opportunity for restorative justice before planning the timing for, of the repair of the mural. Currently, the Equity Collaborative is in the process of creating outreach materials to provide background about the Black Lives Matter movement, about the Santa Cruz Black Lives Matter mural, and about the impact of actions on uh, July 23rd in the community. They'd like to display the materials uh, in, close proximity, in close proximity to the mural, perhaps in the short term in the uh, windows of the library building, and in the longer term in some kind of city hall courtyard uh, display case. The Equity Collaborative will be issuing a public statement in the form of a press release in the near future about what restorative justice means to them. And they'll be asking for endorsement of this statement by the Arts Commission and the City Council. Um, in the very near term, the Equity Collaborative is scheduled to give a presentation on restorative justice and the Black Lives Matter mural at the August Arts Commission meeting tomorrow evening at six. And that's a meeting open to the public and the Zoom uh, details are on the agenda that's posted uh, on the city website. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kathy. For Kathy. Council Member Cummings. I had a, Kathy, thanks for that update. I had a related question. Um, I know that when the mural was uh, defaced, I'd also brought up the fact that the, it appeared that the flag that was supposed to be flown outside of City Hall had also gone missing at some point during the summer. And I wasn't sure um, if there had been any follow-up. And so maybe it's a question for Martine, but um, I, I know that 
had been brought up before too and hadn't and I hadn't really heard any response, but was wondering if there had been any follow-up on that as well. Uh, yes, uh, I believe it was reported to the police. I think we we replaced the flag. Somebody took it, and I think they're they're looking into the scene if they could uh, get any video evidence. So that's being uh, investigated, and followed up on as well. Yeah. And I guess the other question would be because um, I've had a number of people from the community reaching out asking um, about uh, like who they could contact if they're having questions about. The mural and and when it's going to be repaired or what's going to be done. I'm wondering if there's anyone in particular we should direct those questions to. Um, I believe the Yoga for All movement uh, is, hosts the Equity Collaborative, and the Equity Collaborative has a Facebook page. I'd be happy to field any questions and direct them the right way if that's easier for someone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, and there was also um, a town hall a sort of meeting held the Sunday after the incident, and um, we'll take some time. A number of council members did attend that uh, town meeting, and we'll you know provide some uh, under our uh, item number seven today. Any council members that would like to share sort of their um, attendance or follow up activities um, as they've been working um, on the on the Black Lives Matter mural. Uh, vandalism situation, um, please feel, feel free to share that, you know, with, with the public and with other council members during um, item number seven as well. Martine, um, is uh, Bernie, Bernie would be? Yes, next. we have uh, Deputy Chief Escalante who will provide an update on, on the criminal uh, aspects of the, the item. Thank you, Martine. Uh, and uh, good morning, Mayor Myers and all of the council. Um, so a brief, uh, I guess summary of, of the initial response and, and where we are uh, today with the case. Um, as most of you know, um, we had a total of, of five detectives, three detectives, a sergeant and a lieutenant respond uh, Saturday morning um, to uh, start collecting evidence and work the case as soon as we were notified of the, of the vandalism. Um, the, the detectives put in a 12-hour day on that Saturday um, and by the Day, they had two suspects in custody. So it was a, a remarkable job um, by our team, um, I have to say. Um, the uh, district attorney's office has filed two felony charges, uh, felony vandalism and the felony uh, hate crime enhancement. Um, the both suspects are, are out of custody. They, they bailed out um, and continue to process evidence. Um, there's a lot of evidence to go through um, and they continue to work the case uh, every single day and, and chip away at, at a lot of uh, digital evidence that they're, they're sorting through um, to, to, to prove the case. Um, uh, at this point, uh, there is a preliminary hearing before September 20th in Department 6 at 9 a.m. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, a preliminary hearing is, is basically a part of the process for the judge to determine if there's enough evidence to hold uh, the suspects to answer as they, as they call it and, and then proceed to a potential uh, trial, um, not a, a settlement in between that time. So the preliminary hearings on September 20th uh, the, the DA's office will present the evidence uh, before the court and, and they'll determine if, if the suspects will be held to answer. Um, the, the, the detectives also continue to reach out to uh, three others that we know were, were inside the vehicle at the time. Um, and at this point, we believe all or at least two of those uh, passengers were juveniles. Uh, one of them being from outside of the state, so we're we're trying to track those people down. Um, I think uh, you know, obviously, this is an active case, so we don't get into too much detail. We we let the court handle it from here. Um, but I think that uh, as a department and as a city, uh, the response definitely 
uh, sent the message that that as a community we don't we don't tolerate this type of behavior. So um, we're we're proud of our our department and proud of how the the city, including most of all council members, uh, in the response to this as soon as we found out. So uh, I can try to answer that I can uh, if anybody has any. Is there any uh, questions, uh, Council Member Cummings? I just want to start by thanking uh, the police department for a rapid response in this matter. I know that sometimes um, these matters in certain communities may not be taken as seriously, but one thing I've been pointing out to people is that, you know, within 24 hours, you know, we had these two individuals in custody. And um, and I think that's something that's really, that really should be um, highlighted and we should give a lot of credit to our police department for taking this matter seriously. So I just really want to thank uh, Santa Cruz police for really moving swiftly on this case. Um, the other question is, did you know what time the preliminary hearing is on September 20th? Yeah, it's scheduled for nine in, nine in the morning at this point. Um, but if anybody is familiar with the court system, uh, <laughs> standby for the extended um, or, or rescheduling and all of that. But for right now, it's at 9 a.m. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from council members or questions? Yeah, I just um, also just want to give my thanks to um, to the uh, police department, um, Chief Mills, and City Manager Martin Bernal, and also Kathy. Um, that was a really busy weekend. Um, also, I want to recognize Elizabeth Smith. There was a lot going on just from the period of time when. Um, there, the notification of the vandalism had happened. Um, and uh, yeah, I arrived at the scene and the police were there within minutes of me really notifying um, that. System. So I'm just, uh, I really do want our community to know that our police um, department was immediate and um, very thorough in what they did um, really within minutes of the reporting of what had happened. Um, so I do really, really want to recognize um, your department's work, um, Deputy Chief, and just the response from our Public Works Department, um, obviously Kathy uh, immediately becoming available that weekend, or Team Bernal, um, you know, getting city staff, um, getting the questions answered as quickly as possible. So I do want our public to know that this is a, a very, very high priority, um, and certainly we'll get um, updates the mural um, as much as we can during this period, during the city manager's um, you know, updates as needed so we can at least use our council meetings as a, a place to where people can learn what's going on. So um, just wanna say those thanks as well. Um, if there's no further questions, Martin, do, is that, do you have any other items today? No, that, that's it, thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you all. Next up is, I'll now call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the city council calendar. Bonnie, do we have any? Sorry, no, we have no updates. Okay, great, thank you. Mayor, I was wondering if I could ask a question um, related to the calendar and this is largely for the uh, city attorney. Sure. Um, I was just wondering, so, um, item number 36 that's on our agenda today. Um, we've been getting a lot of um, people reaching out to us from the community wanting to have some kind of discussion around this item. And this item is related to the 831 Water Street project. Um, and so I don't know what the appropriate way is that we can go about having a discussion, but knowing that a lot of people, that this is a pretty controversial item and um, that there appears to be some differences in opinion between members of the public and the staff's interpretation of the role that council plays with regards to the density bonus law. Um, I'm wondering if there's, if there could be an opportunity for us to discuss this um, since it's on our agenda, but it's not a discussion item. Um, and so I was wondering if you could provide some clarity about how we can potentially discuss this item. Cause I think since it is on technically on our agenda, but not for discussion that if we can have some discussion about it, that um, it might be helpful for the members of our community who are, you know, really passionate about this item. So um, I don't, I don't, um, I see the planning director is 
um, uh, in attendance this um, this afternoon. Um, I also received correspondence from members of the public requesting to have a discussion on this item. Unfortunately, however, it is uh, listed on your agenda as an information item after the uh, the adjournment of the meeting, and so. Uh, a member of the public who is, uh, you know, looking over the agenda would get the impression that it is not listed as an item for discussion. And so I think if you had a discussion uh, on this item, you would deprive members of the public who in good faith read the agenda of an opportunity to participate and discuss and maybe just tuned out the meeting. Um, I do believe that the, that the memo that was presented to the uh, council as an information item does identify the opportunity for the council to review the project and make comments on its consistency with objective standards in our general plan and zoning code. And so that's what I was just hoping to confirm with the planning director is that there is that opportunity. And I, my recollection from reviewing the item is correct. Uh, that will likely happen uh, in mid-September. Yeah, I was going to say that, that that we have agendized this item. We will be agendizing this item on September 14th. That is currently scheduled, just so the public is, is clear. And I believe the memo might mention that it's somewhere in the memo. But yeah, Question, uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on that because, yes, that is very clear in the memo. But given the number of people who contacted um, at least some council members, and I know all the whole council got some communications. There are people who, who really want to be able to talk about this and want to see the council take um, more of a role um, within the confines of SB 35. There are things we can do, and I don't want to talk about it right now because I know it's not on our agenda, but given all of that, I feel like um, we should provide an opportunity for um, to have a discussion about this um, before we get to the end of the timeline. We don't, we won't have much time for 14th given the 60 um, day turnaround. So, you know, I, I just, I just would like to see us have an opportunity to discuss this and um, make some recommendations prior to the kind of final moment when we we hear well it's everything is fully formed and it's done and there's not much that can be done that that seems to happen a lot and um, so I'm just wondering if we could get a response on where else we might be able to um, have an opportunity for for folks to discuss this or will they we just have to maybe suggest that they come to oral communications. Lee, do you want to answer that? Sure. The first thing that I would suggest is that um, we're hosting the second community meeting for this on Thursday evening. Um, the, the first one was held earlier this year and it was about two and a half hours. Um, this one is um, also scheduled for an evening session, um, uh, an evening time. I believe it's 6 p.m. Um, this Thursday. And the information is our website, you can um, go to the 831 Water Street Project website and find the latest plans, the um, FYI memo that was sent to the council that details the process. That also provides a link to the HCD regulations that, that um, go into significant detail um, about the overall process. And um, that meeting is a, a great opportunity for people to um, provide feedback and to um, hear about um, what's proposed and about the process that um, we're mandated to follow through SB 35. If I could just respond very quickly. I think the, the point that um, I'm trying to make is, is not, I think there are many very well uh, informed about what's happening and they've been following this very closely, um, doing other uh, research from what I understand. So I think it's, there are people not only who want a, an opportunity to hear the, you know, what what the city is, is saying. I mean, they have that information, but want to be able to engage about it. So, um, you know, that that is going to be a day that the, there's possibility of having, giving that input um, on Thursday. But um, I'm just kind of wondering if there's any space for 
you know, input and discussion because the last community meeting that I went to didn't appear to have that. It was very much a, um, you know, just raise your hand and say, give your testimony and move on. So again, just to find ways to open up a conversation. Um, this is what I hear people wanting to, to do. Sure, well, I'm, I'm happy to pass that feedback along with respect to um, responding uh, to questions. I know that many of the um, questions were responded to at the last community meeting. However, there were also um, you know, over 200 people, if I'm recalling correctly, at that meeting. And um, uh, we, we did allow everyone to speak who wanted to, um, and that you know, was, as I mentioned, a, a two and a half hour meeting. So, um, uh, you know, I'm happy to pass that information along and um, talk with the team about um, responding to questions um, so that um, you know, the, um, the response to some of the comments that are received is also provided as part of the discussion. I, I do, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll just note, um, Councilmember Brown, that, um, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to balance at those meetings, you know, trying to um, allow for as many people to participate as possible. Um, when you've got, you know, a couple hundred people on the line, um, with um, providing lengthy dialogue back and forth, and and those are some competing interests. But I will also say that our staff has been in communications um, regularly. Um, with uh, members of the public. And so I would encourage them if they want to, to have dialogue outside of a formal meeting, to go ahead and reach out to the project manager, Ryan Bain, reach out to um, the um, current planning principal planner, Samantha Hatcher, and you know, they've been having regular conversations with members of the community and be ongoing, I'm sure, throughout the process. And uh, Tony, uh, uh, excuse me, Lee, would you mind just maybe, just so the public knows, I know this is agendized, um, will that be a, I would anticipate we'll be accepting public comment on September 14th as well. Um, the council has the opportunity to engage on the question around um, the objective standards, correct? That's correct, yes. In fact, you know, what we'll be presenting is um, uh, an analysis of um, all of the objective standards that we believe are applicable to the project, along with um, the, an analysis of whether the project is consistent with those objective standards or not. And I know staff is, is busy working on um, that analysis now. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure we don't go too far into exactly to this too far. Uh, Tony, are we going a little far into this um, in terms? Of this is this is the item, um, the meeting calendar. So I just want to ch double check where we're at with regards to. This I stuff. think we're I think we're okay, but we're getting close to uh, you know as far as a little bit close. Okay, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to, um, you know, in terms of recommendations for what we're able to discuss at the, at the next meeting. I, I hear the um, item about the objective standards, but I think there's also some concern around density bonus and um, you know the council being able to be considered an approval body um, for density bonus concessions and waivers. Will that be a part of the discussion as well? Because it seems like there is there is the potential for the city to um, play a role in you know the approval of the density bonus and uh, I just want to make sure that since that's brought up by the community whether we'll have the opportunity to discuss that as well um, I could speak in detail about um, that um, and our uh, our analysis of that but I don't think that that's uh, the right time for that I'll just leave it as yes um, we will be providing the council with an analysis of um, the density bonus as well as um, the um, potential uh, for the council to how the council can review the density bonus under the SB 35 regulations and we have been and will continue to work closely with our city attorney's office on that. Okay, thank you. And I would imagine council members uh, with your department, Lee, with many, all these questions leading up to, 
to the absolutely thank you very much mayor myers i would encourage any of you who have questions related to that to reach out to me and i'm happy to have conversations with you offline and likewise to my office thank you vice mayor brewer uh, i just wanted to say in relation to the calendar um it would be helpful to have staff and maybe we could consider the September 14th or a special uh, meeting time to have SB 35 discussion being this is the first one or density bonus um, helps the, the community and the council members and staff to consider that. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay, any other comments? Um, on the meeting calendar, not seeing any. Okay, we will move on. Um, why don't we take a um, just a five minute break um, and just a little bio break and just come back in at uh, twelve twenty. We'll start our council memberships in city groups and outside agency agenda next or item next, which is item number seven. So we'll just take a five minute break come back and uh, we'll be at I agenda item number seven for the public. external at external boards, committees, and joint power authority meetings. And uh, I'll go ahead and just sort of go one by one as I see you on the screen. Um, the Vice Mayor Bruner. And for the members of the public, we're on item number seven on our agenda. This is reports on outside, council memberships and city groups and outside agencies. Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Uh, let's see, I will start with the Visit Santa Cruz uh, board meeting um, and an action item out of that. Uh, Maggie Ivey has served 26 years um, on that board and announced retirement from uh, Visit Santa Cruz. And so a, uh, a new search committee is being formed to hire a replacement. Uh, so very significant, Maggie Ivy has just been a very valuable um, evolving that organization over the years. And so we received very in-depth um, stats. I will, uh, regarding uh, visitors and um, online versus in person over the past year and um, that those were interesting numbers overall to receive uh, that information um, and it's really broken down into very detailed analysis um, in terms of travel guides and wildlife watch guides and online um, visitors and what they're looking for in the city of Santa Cruz and in the county of Santa Cruz and, and um, uh, different platforms. So that was a brief, quick summary of the Visit Santa Cruz board. And I will let Mayor uh, Martin Watkins, Council Member Watkins also attended that meeting. So if, if they have anything else to add to that, um, at the other meeting was community meeting, as you mentioned, Mayor Myers, um, following the Black Lives Matter mural vandalism, and um, that was well attended, and we had several council members in, in attendance at that meeting as well, 
and it was attended by the media, and it was an update on, um, at the time, it was an update on the uh, police uh, and, and the progress at that time, and also a space to really talk about uh, action going forward, which has led to some um, very concrete uh, steps from council members working in various ways going forward to help ensure that our community can feel safe um, in different ways uh, moving forward and that actions like this that happen to, in the vandalism um, can be addressed in our policy and tied in with our health and all policies. So uh, that, that created a, a great action point uh, for, for uh, us moving forward. And that's all I have to report. Great, thank you, Vice Mayor Bruner. Next I'll call on uh, Council Member Watkins. Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think I'll start also with Visit Santa Cruz, um, kind of just briefly piggybacking on what Vice Mayor Bruner said. The only um, additional input I'd share was just the, um, because the hoteliers who are on that board sharing their challenges with actually getting product and just sort of a symbol of delay that I think a lot of businesses are experiencing um, as well as management of kind of tourism and influx of tourism, although we're kind of um, entering in sort of a component of our tourism and as we're leaving our summer months. Um, let's see, we have our CJC meeting this Thursday. Um, in addition, I guess I just say how appreciative I am of our police department, of a mayor and vice mayor and all those who attended our community event following the vandalism of the Black Lives Matter mural. It was really great to hear the voices of the community to allow that space for processing. And there was, a, I think, overall a sentiment around um, wanting healing and wanting um, ongoing dialogue. And um, I, so I just sort of want to share that with our community and my colleagues that um, weren't able to attend that. Um, let's had a core update at our community program. Oh, so sorry, <laughs> my dog just came in and started barking. We had a core update at our community programs um, meeting uh, right before the uh, July break. And then lastly, with public safety, we had a conversation about restorative justice and wanting to move in that direction um, and direction follow um, prior council direction around wanting to see our Police department move in that direction. Also, um, kind of just starting conversation and community awareness around um, the impacts of hypodermic needle waste in high, highly sensitive areas, um, bike storage, as well as crime reports. And um, and then just briefly, I know that the city manager's office has had a um, kind of uh, um, staffing, but one of the things we were also talking about prior to some staff being on leave is really starting a conversation around redefining public safety and eventually having that conversation come to the full council. We, um, I've learned that a number of communities have actually really started uh, this process and I think it really aligns with some of the conversation we heard at the community event around wanting to have kind of a common understanding of what we, we all feel is um, a component of public safety. So that should be forthcoming. Um, and I know we intended to have that coming sooner rather than later, but given some, some of the staffing challenges, it has not um, been on the full council agenda. I think that about covers my um, membership. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Hawkins. Council Member Brown. Thank you. I um, will speak first about the Regional Transportation Commission meeting, which was held last Thursday. Um, we had a, a couple of items on the agenda that I think were uh, really critical to uh, the maintenance of the, the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Corridor, um, in particular, uh, forward with work on two of the sites that were um, washed out as a result of the 2017 storms. So moving along and, and trying to get that, um, that work done 
and also a, a project to address uh, coastal erosion in, at the Manresa um, beach section of the rail line where there's significant, significant challenges and um, there's a lot of work needs to be done, but we did, uh, you know, the, the ability of the, the RTC to at least um, uh, make a commitment to um, building some retaining walls and, you know, kind of just shoring it up for now. And so those were um, obviously, uh, there's, there will be cost to those, but the RTC uh, measure defunds will cover those. And uh, the other uh, committee meeting that I would want to report on is the, the seniors, the council, the AAA, Area Agency on Aging. Uh, I don't have um, any much to report aside from uh, one really critical issue that I've mentioned before, but it's starting to become much more urgent. So folks who are out there um, listening and uh, you know, folks in, in the um, Zoom meeting here, uh, the uh, Meals on Wheels, it's, the Live Oak Senior Center is going to be um, uh, probably raised to develop uh, housing and some, some other uh, facilities for the Live Oak School District. And um, they are desperately looking for a location uh, that where they can continue to prepare meals. It's where all the Meals on Wheels um, meals are prepared. It's a congregate um, dining setting and other meetings happen there. And so this is going to be a really big loss. And um, so they are trying desperately to find a location that would be suitable to um, engage in those activities and have some office space. Um, all we're, we're just looking for anybody who has thoughts and ideas on how that, um, you know, just what's out there, what's available. Um, and I think that that's all from me. Um, I did not get to attend the BLM, the, the meeting at the community room. I was out of town, but I was able to watch it. Um, they, so I appreciate everybody who was able to be there and share your commitment to um, moving forward in a productive, positive way. Mayor, you're muted. Council member calling Tori Johnson. <laughs> Just wondering if you were calling on me. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with the BLM that I was able to attend and want to just echo my thanks to um, the mayor and um, police chief and all the community members who showed up. Um, I won't repeat what my colleagues have already said, but um, just want to echo, say, state that what I heard loud and clear was um, an ask for meaningful continuous dialogue and an ask to really look at how we how we measure racial equity and racial justice in our community um, and where the gaps might be. So um, there were other dialogue conversations and points brought up, but those were two of the pieces that I um, took from that community meeting. And I am working with Vice Mayor Brunner and Mayor Myers um, on operationalizing some of these pieces that were brought up both at the community meeting as well as follow-up letters from um, Black coalitions and other allies. Um, I would like to give an update on the Metro Board. Um, actually, our next meeting is, is this Friday, so, but we hadn't met. Um, we met last uh, June, just after our, our prior. So it's been a while, but it was um, um, a packed meeting. We talked about, we approved the FY21-22 budget, uh, which is about $55 million. Um, we renewed the CEO's contract for another three years, Alex Clifford. And um, there was an ask by um, the Metro Board to support the infrastructure bill, which um, I see just passed the Senate this morning. So this is a trillion dollar bipartisan bill um, that would really significantly provide investments for public transportation um, and it would go to local communities. So um, it's there's an item on our consent agenda for the city council to also support this, but Metro Board um, put forward letters to, to, to our representatives in Congress to support this. Um, I'll let Mayor Myers add anything that I might've missed. It was a packed meeting, but pieces that I pulled out. Um, 
Councilmember Watkins uh, touched on the Community Programs Committee, um, but just to add to that, um, we're working with city staff um, to look at the core RFP process that should be coming out soon. And um, city staff is going to be meeting with, um, with um, the county consultants who are working on core and with CBOs this week to engage in how this could look different. It's gonna look very different from the last round of funding. So that will, there's be, there'll be more coming to the council probably in September around um, the core funding and how we'll allocate those funds in our community a little differently. Um, I also attended the RTC meeting that council member Brown touched on that. And I think that's it. Great, thank, thank you. you. Council member Clontar Johnson. Uh, council member Cumming. Thank you. Um, just let folks know I, I wasn't able to attend the community meeting regarding the mural, but I was able to attend the hearing and I've been engaged in many conversations with the people around um, the vandalism that occurred there. And um, it's similar to what folks have been saying. I think overwhelmingly people want to see a restorative justice, let, see the through a restorative justice lens uh, rather than a punitive lens. So hopefully we can continue to have discussions about, you know, what comes maybe around this. Uh, um, since the last council meeting, um, I was able to attend the LAFCO meeting on um, October or August 4th. Um, there was one annexation of a parcel um, to Somner uh, in Scotts Valley to CSA 10. Um, and so that resolution was adopted. And then the other um, item was the countywide parks and recreation service and sphere review. And um, this was to review um, the park districts of Boulder Creek, La Selva Beach, um, Opal Cliffs and all the recreation. And ultimately um, in approving the uh, parks and recreation service and sphere of influence review, um, we reaffirmed the sphere of influence for Boulder Creek um, recreation and park district and La Selva Beach recreation, recreation and park district. Um, but then we adopted a, a zero sphere of influence for the Alba Recreation Park District, Oak Cliffs Recreation District, um, and recommended dissolution of those two districts by August of 2022. And so um, that would require that the um, that those two districts initiate the dissolution um, of those districts um, with concurrent annexation into County Service Area 10 by December 2021. And if neither of those parties in, the commission will consider initiating a, a dissolution in accordance with um, government code. And so um, that's pretty much all I have to report on LAFCO. All right. Thank you, council member. Um, I think I am next. Just a couple of things. Um, the Cal's working group did not um, actually meet over the summer um, or since June, but just to reiterate, um, Cal's Beach was off the beach bummer list uh, again this year, so that's good news. Um, so that's the second year in a row now it's been able to stay off that list, which is great news. Um, the, there will be a city select committee meeting on August 27th, and I have brought forward the Live Oak um, Senior Center potential closure as an agenda item for the city select committee, which is a meeting of all four mayors in the county as well as with the county so that we can have that conversation there. That is a public meeting and that will be on August 27th at two o'clock. So that will be a, a place where we can have a conversation about the loss of that facility and its impacts across um, the whole county um, and in our individual cities. Um, I attended the two by two committee member uh, committee meetings um, throughout the summer. Um, the big news from those are a couple of things there. Um, one is that we did um, receive notification from Senator Lair's office that he was able to um, uh, identify and, and secure 14.5 million to bring to city of Santa Cruz for um, addressing and uh, helping with our homeless um, needs. And, and um, we will be convening um, a meeting with he and assembly member Mark Stone probably in the next few weeks um, once some of the budget things get done in Sacramento. Um, and certainly we will be uh, 
providing a full update. Um, uh, both the county will and the city will uh, in regards to the use of those funds. And uh, the two by two will be sort of one of the, the main groups that sort of helps facilitate sort of a, um, a description of where those funds may go. Um, very thankful that Senator Laird um, really um, sees the uh, severity of the issue that we're dealing with and was able to bring those resources um, to the city and the county to work with um, to continue to work on addressing homelessness more uh, services as well as um, shelter and other needs for folks um, who are experiencing homelessness here in Santa Cruz. Um, the two by two committee also had a meeting with the uh, Department of Housing, Community Housing, uh, the head of the home project home key and project room key. Uh, we had the staff of each of those organizations uh, excuse me, each of those agencies in attendance to understand the upcoming opportunities um, with Project Home Key and Project um, Room Key. Uh, between those two, um, between those two sources, I believe there's almost three billion dollars in, in uh, monies available to again address homelessness and try to um, expedite the, the development of housing. We talked about various opportunities here in Santa Cruz as well as throughout the county. Um, and that does include, could include things such as buying properties and things like that as well. So it's not just for purchasing motels. They made it very clear communities have been using that those funds for purchasing other types of buildings as well as other properties. So um, we've been working, um, uh, Supervisor McPherson organized that um, specific um, meeting as well as Senator Laird's office also facilitated and arranged that meeting with Senator, or excuse me, with Supervisor McPherson's office taking the lead on organizing the discussion with the, the those city folks. So we're getting a lot of assistance with really getting connected with um, state agencies that will be looking at um, just distributing some of the funds um, that the governor has put out for homelessness. Um, attended the, uh, the Downtown Management Corporation um, meeting this past month as well, and um, very much focused on getting services and um, uh, working downtown to help with um, the area more activated as well as um, working towards, you know, addressing some of the some of the um, improvements while we're, we're transitioning, obviously through some of the empty storefronts. So that group has been very active um, and also in touch with our um, economic development um, department as well. And um, I think that is it for me in terms of report outs. And I do wanna thank also um, the community for attending the Sunday morning meeting after um, the Black Lives uh, matter mural um, vandalism. We had a really, um, it was, I think about 50 to 60 people there. We had really good, um, it was uh, a very, um, it was a good meeting. People were very emotional, obviously. And, um, you know, we will continue um, to bring items forward um, for our community and for the uh, city council to consider in ways that um, we think are meaningful in terms of um, change, uh, you know, addressing some of the um, issues that are, this, this is obviously shown. We've also, uh, I've done some outreach with my uh, fellow mayors, as well as I know some of the folks who work in the education field have done some outreach with um, some of our education leaders as well. And so this really will be a community effort to um, really address what was, um, you know, a very obvious attack on on members of our community. So um, I think that's it. The only other meetings I was uh, involved in, I did do a, a couple of meetings with Tannery uh, Arts uh, community members regarding some of the issues across the river, as well as um, issues with the campus and some upcoming items and uh, attended several of those meetings uh, during the summer as well. So but we will move on to the next item. The next item is our consent agenda. And these are items eight through 26 on our agenda today. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to uh, comment on items eight through 26. Instructions will be on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine 
your hand and then listen for the cues saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any members who wish to comment or pull any of the items from our consent agenda today? Council member Brown? Yeah, I just, I have a comment on item, I believe it's 11, let me just double check. Um, no, it's not 11, sorry. Yes, it is, item 11, thank you. Okay. okay, is there any other council members that have comments or questions or would like to pull an item on the, on the consent agenda? Okay. With that, uh, we will uh, go ahead and, um, Sandy, why don't we go ahead and have your comment on item 11 and then we'll uh, bring it out for public comment and then we'll look for a motion on the consent agenda. Okay, sure, thanks. Um, so I just wanted to thank my colleagues for um, bringing this forward. This is a, a pretty significant struggle uh, that um, this group of work has been um, through and um, and I do appreciate your uh, pointing out that um, we we want to support workers in their efforts to um, both unionize and improve their workplaces uh, and um, I just want to say I, I hope that we all um, continue to have that approach and make those commitments when we are um, addressing our own city workforce. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. I'll go ahead um, and if there are members of the public that would like to speak on any agenda, on any item on our consent agenda, there's been no items pulled today. Now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. And I see we have Mark McCliss uh, is in attendance today and has his hand up. Go ahead, Mark. Pardon me, Mayor, I would, I would just like to remind the council that um, for agenda item 19, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner has recused herself. There's no reason to pull that from the agenda, but it should be reflected in the minutes. Thank you, yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna do that. Thank you, Tony, appreciate that. Mr. McCliss, go ahead, please. Uh, good evening, my name is Mark McCliss. I'm calling about item number 11. I've been a security officer for Dignity Health for three years now. Security officers across Dignity Health have suffered immeasurable inequalities. Security officers suffer constant harassment, intimidation by upper management, violence, low staffing, lack of proper protective equipment and resources, continuous COVID exposures, and unequal benefits and pay. For example, the janitorial staff get paid about $6 more per hour than a security officer dealing with the constant influx of behavioral patients in the facility. And you have, may, you have may seen those touching human kindness commercials. Now, if you were employed by Dignity Health, you would also know about our mission, which refers to our commitment to social justice. Social justice means equality, freedom, fighting against injustices, and to fight for the common good. Management does, up, does not uphold this mission with their frontline security workers at Dignity facilities. Dignity Health's vision states a healthier future for all. Our, as security officers, our healthy future can only start with gaining the respect, equality, and social justice from Dignity Health management throughout their facilities. Dignity Health's values state compassion, inclusion, integrity, excellence, and collaboration. This is all we as security officers are asking for. Dignity Health claims to be committed to these core values. Several hundred security officers, officers across the state of California are asking for compassion for the security workers, inclusion in the same benefits and programs offered to other coworkers. As frontline workers, we deserve collaboration to work with our employer to give and receive social justice. Today, I'm asking the council to unanimously adopt the resolution supporting the right of security officers at Dignity Health facilities to have their social justice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCliss. Is there any other attendees um, today in the meeting that would like to speak to our uh, consent agenda? I am not seeing any. Okay. I will go ahead and bring this back to council for uh, any additional deliberation or to look for a motion, please. Council Member Brown. 
Member Cumming and Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. I'll go ahead and move the um, consent agenda. Member Colin Tari Johnson. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion from Council Member Cumming, seconded by Calentari, seconded by Council Member Colantari Johnson. Um, and uh, moving the uh, the entirety of the consent agenda with the um, with the note for item 19 that um, Council Member, or excuse me, Vice Mayor Bruner um, will not be voting on that item. Uh, can I ask the clerk, please? Please call the roll vote. Roll call vote. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Council Member Golder is absent. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Great. Okay, we will now move on to paperwork started out here. Our public hearing, which is going to be item number 27 on our agenda. And let's move this on here. Number 27 is a public hearing or uh, the municipal code amendments relating to accessory, accessory dwelling units responding to mo modifications requested by the California Coastal Commission. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. Uh, today we'll have a presentation by Sarah Noyce, our senior planner, and Matt Van Waar, our principal planner. And again, this is on item number 27. This is for municipal code amendments relating to accessory Accessory dwelling units responding to modifications requested by the California Coastal Commission. So I'll turn it over to Sarah or Matt and or Matt. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Uh, my name is Sarah Noisy. I work in the Planning and Community Development Department in the Advanced Planning Section. And I've been the planner primarily responsible for um, updating our municipal code as it relates to accessory dwelling units or sometimes called granny units, um, essentially separate units that are built on site with um, typically traditionally with a single family home, but um, with the updates to state law that came into effect at the beginning of 2020, they're now also permitted on parcels with multifamily housing. Um, and so many of the council members may be aware that we have been updating our code. We've updated it several times in the last two or three years um, to bring it into compliance with state law. So at, at first we were kind of leading the state and then you know the state caught up and exceeded us in certain areas. And so we've gone through several rounds of um, amendments, two or three rounds, and um, some of the changes we made actually are in portions of the code that are subject to review by the Coastal Commission. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now and we'll, we'll walk through how that process works when the Coastal Commission reviews our ordinances and where we are today. So can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. So. Um, we updated, as I mentioned, our ordinance to comply with state law. So those amendments related to, um, you know, development standards, where on a site a, a unit could be built, what size it could be built. They also related to the permit process that could be required for this type of dwelling unit. And also one of the one of the big changes that we made was related to parking and how much parking was required for um, ADUs. So um, some of those changes, amendments, as I mentioned, are in portions of our municipal code that are part of our local coastal program or LCP, which means that they affect coastal resources or access to the coastline and that therefore they are subject to review by the California Coastal Commission, which is a state agency that has jurisdiction over development in the coastal zone. So 
Um, the state law as it changed required uh, municipalities to adopt a lot of changes to their code. And there is one section in there that says, you know, you have to make all these changes and or nothing in this code shall supersede the Coastal Act of 1976. So um, to the extent that the Coastal Act requires protection of coastal resources and access to the coastline, the Coastal Commission maintains their jurisdiction over those um, provisions and the places where there's sort of tension or conflict between the requirements for ADUs and the requirements of the Coastal Act. Um, we sort of get into a place where we're negotiating with the Coast Commission, um, each jurisdiction to sort of find the right fit and the right answer for these different things. So typically when we make an amendment to our LCP or the portions of our Muni code that are part of our LCP, we um, conduct an analysis to show how they are consistent with the LCP, you know, to ensure that they are consistent with the LCP and we submit that to the, the Coastal Commission. Sometimes they request more analysis and, you know, we kind of go back and forth and explain to them how the, you know, proposed amendments are going to function within the LCP and within our rest of our Muni code and our general plan. And typically that conversation um, and the additional analysis we provide is, is enough to sort of have them feel convinced that we, you know, are complying with the Coastal Act and that the actions we're taking aren't going to have a negative impact on coastal resources or on the ability of um, all Californians to access their coastline. Sometimes, however, it's not enough. And this is one of those times where they actually um, feel pretty strongly that there were some places, some amendments, some further modifications to our proposed um, LCP amendment. And, um, you know, we entered into a good faith negotiation with them and, you know, this isn't a perfect outcome. Um, and I think this is actually a really good outcome, this place where we've come to the, the modifications are reasonable and we're trying to balance these conflicts. We're very interested in ensuring that there's access to the coastline. Um, and so just so that we're all familiar with the process, um, the Coastal Commission has is recommending that our um, that the city make these amendments to our ordinance. Um, if we choose not to, we actually start over completely. So we would have to, you know, rewrite the ordinance basically from scratch, go to the commission, back to the city council, first and second reading, and then resubmit to the Coastal Commission a new ordinance. So um, I'm really hopeful we can we can move this through today. And if there are any concerns or you know questions we have or like further work we'd want to do, we we would re I would really request that we start that as a new process because we do have some applicants that are waiting to submit applications um, based on these this ordinance in the coastal zone. So there are three areas that the Coastal Commission wanted us to address. The first was the applicability of the coastal development permit process. There are just a few areas in the coastal zone where um, coastal development permits are still required for ADUs and they just wanted to make sure we were pointing that out really clearly in our code. So we added some additional language in two, two places in the code to just reiterate, yes, this is required. You know, yes, you are gonna need a coastal development circumstances. Then there were a couple of changes to sort of clarify and in, in one case actually correct one of our existing standards about um, when ADUs are allowed on multifamily zoned property that they're actually allowed also with a multifamily structure, not just with a single family home on a multifamily zoned property. Um, so we were glad that they caught that and we were able to roll that correction into this um, modification. And then the place where we of our time negotiating was about the parking requirements for ADUs in the coastal zone. So the city had eliminated all parking requirements for ADUs. So um, the ordinance that we proposed required zero parking for ADUs anywhere in the city. And um, the Coastal Commission really wasn't comfortable with that in areas, especially areas closest to the coast where they know visitors for that on-street parking to you know, facilitate their visit to the coastline. So the place where we ended up, the language that's in the proposed um, ordinance today would require um, some replacement parking in the coastal zone. So where parking is removed, that's um, either in a driveway or on a parking pad, so not in a garage or not in a carport, it would be required to be replaced within the coastal zone. And then um, within this area between the line shown on this map and the water, any ADUs that are built there will require one additional parking space for the ADU, and then they will require that any parking that gets removed or, um, has, or is converted, you know, in the case of a converting a garage, all that parking will need to be replaced in order to meet the parking requirement for the primary um, residential use on the property. So that's different outside the coastal zone, 
no replacement parking is required and no parking is required for the ADU. So there are, we are gonna have um, some sites closer to the coast that's gonna be a little bit more challenging to you know, get that parking configured. And this is the, um, the balance that we were able to strike with the Coastal Commission. So our next steps from today, you know, if, if we, assuming we, we approve this first reading of the ordinance, the second reading will take place at the next thing on August 24th. And then the ordinance would take effect 30 days after that. So in the meantime, we will be submitting the adopted ordinance to the Coastal Commission for their determination that it is adequate and complete. And then that determination is reviewed by the Coastal Commission at during one of their public hearings. And so we're hoping to be at their public hearing in the middle of September, which would allow all of these um, changes to really take effect and be available to our applicants in the coastal zone the month of September, 2021. So with that, our recommendation is that your city council um, pass a motion to adopt a resolution acknowledging receipt of the resolution of certification from the California Coastal Commission, including the suggested modifications and introduced for publication an ordinance amending chapters 2404, 2410, and 2412 of the Municipal Code related to ADUs in response to action by the California Coastal Commission. And if there are any questions. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, are there any questions from council members? Council member Contari Johnson. Thank you for that update, Sarah. Um, uh, what, within the zone that's required to replace parking, um, do we have an approximate count of how many parcels or how many sites that is? And, and, and how we would suspect or think that that would impact the building of ADUs? Um, so I don't have an exact number of parcels in that area. Um, you know, that's certainly something we could run in our GIS. My guess is that it's um, in like probably around a thousand parcels. Um, and I, you know, I think some of those parcels, uh, it's not gonna be too hard to actually meet that parking requirement. I think a lot of those parcels already have the three parking spaces that would be required. So, you know, we made these changes to our residential parking standards at the end of 2020 that now sort of max out any residential use at two parking spaces is the most that could ever be required. And so, you know, two plus one for the ADU would be a total of three. And I think a lot of places can, can accommodate that. Um, I think once you get into neighborhoods that are sort of closer to the harbor or um, over in Seabright, that's gonna be trickier. Those lots are smaller. They're, you know, those are built, those are older neighborhoods and it is gonna be more difficult. And I think there probably are gonna be some places in those areas that aren't accommodate that parking and won't be able to build an ADU. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I had a similar question. Um, Sarah, did you, did you guys talk about alternatives to parking, for example, providing bikes or, you know, is it, you know, especially, you know, just curious if there was any conversation around trying to kind of wreck the value of additional afford, you know, units, obviously, and balancing that with impact um, for visitors coming, you know, mm -hmm. interesting perspective they bring to the table, certainly, because, um, but I was just curious if there was other opportunities, um, or, you know, obviously the jump bike, not, not jump anymore, but, the, you know, shared bike system or even, you know, bicycle parking, et cetera, things like that because our coastal area is so dense, you know, I mean, it's like anywhere you would want to get to, you can walk or bike to mostly. So I'm just curious if there was conversations around those. Yeah, we talked about a lot of stuff related to parking. We actually, I actually went out and um, parking to sort of count all the cars that were on the street at, you know, 7 a.m. on a weekday to in an attempt to demonstrate how much parking is really available to visitors, um, you know, we, and, looking at all of the parking resources that are available, both, you know, paid and free, but striped. Um, and I, while we didn't necessarily discuss bikes, you know, ex explicitly, um, we talked about a lot of different things and their concern was really about um, making sure that folks that are visiting really from like the Central Valley are able to come and they don't have to pay in order to access the coastline. So that there's some sort of resource for them to, as Californians, get access to the coast for free. And, um, you know, really street parking is what provides that, you know, you have to pay to park at the 
you have to pay to park at the boardwalk. Um, even after, you know, you have to pay to park at meters in a lot of places. And um, I, I know that I don't have all of the details on that, but I know that we've had some um, challenges with the Coastal Commission just in terms of, you know, limiting parking along West Cliff to two hours to ensure that there is turnover and there is access provided for, you know, new visitors and pe people throughout the day. Um, that hasn't always been an easy sell with, um, there certainly are other other options for managing parking. It's an, it's an ongoing conversation we have with them. Anytime we talk about parking near the coast, it gets, um, it just takes a long time, honestly. They're just, they're really concerned about maintaining that free access. Yeah, okay, so yeah, yeah, not surprised when I read the staff report. I mean, not surprised, you know, I mean, perspective they bring to their analysis. Yeah, and they did, you know, we really, you know, they had started off asking for a lot more and we really were able to sort of demonstrate and show them that really the demand, if they're really concerned about access to the coastline, then we're really concerned about, you know, sort of those first 300 feet, mm -hmm. um, you know, adjacent to the coast and the whole coastal zone, because there are places in the coastal zone where you'd have to walk, you know, path of travel, it's almost three miles to get to the beach. You know, there's no reason that we should be requiring those places to provide parking, um, you know, as it, it, under an auspice of um, visitor access. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions from council? I'll bring this out to the public now. Um, this is for item number 27, which is the municipal code amendments relating to accessory dwelling units responding to modifications requested by the California Coastal Commission. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an action, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the and using the instructions on your screen, the order, excuse me, um, I'm not seeing, if you are interested in commenting, please raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. And I'm not seeing any hands coming up. So I don't believe we have any folks here today that would like to speak on this. So I'm gonna bring it back to council for a motion. Uh, council Member Brown, or further deliberation. Council yeah. Member Brown and then. Thank you. Brown. Yeah, I would go ahead and make the motion that we, um, uh, move the, the staff recommendation as it's, it's as it's written, and that would be to adopt a resolution acknowledging receipt of the resolution of certification from the California Coastal Commission, including the suggested modifications and introducing for publication and ordinance amending those chapters 24.04, 24.10, and 24.12 uh, related to ADUs in response to action by the Coastal Commission. Great, and Council Member Cummings? I'll go ahead and second that motion. Okay. And I see Vice Mayor Bruner, did you have a question or comment? No, you're right. okay, great. So we have a motion by Council Member Brown with a second by Council Member Cummings um, to um, basically adopt the staff recommendation and could we have a roll call vote, please, Paul? Mm -hmm. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Councilmember Golder is absent. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Uh, let's see. Okay. I'm just sending a quick note. Okay, next up is our general business items. And uh, these are items number 28, 29, 30, and 31 on our agenda this afternoon. Um, Councilmember Golder is um, planning to come into the meeting, has requested that we move item number 29 to the end of these items. So Bonnie, um, if you could, for the record, just make sure that we know that uh, 29 will be taken up after item number 31. Um, okay, and um, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, we are now on item number 28. If this item is, 
is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. If you are interested in commenting on item number 28, which is re-envision Santa Cruz interim recovery plan update, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. I'll let uh, folks know in the public when you, it's time for public comment, I'll be announcing those directly. So I'll go ahead and turn this item over to Laura Schmidt, our Assistant City Manager for a presentation today. <clears throat> Laura, we can't hear you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I was double mute the extra thing. <laughs> You were so muted that actually your mute button didn't even show up anymore. So somehow you broke the mute on Zoom. Well done. Yeah. You know, we former IT people have ways to double mute ourselves. <laughs> Just you really in case. The world, don't you? Um, thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Council members. I'm here to give you an update on re-envision Santa Cruz, building a future for everyone together. So this follows up on the uh, strategic plan that you all developed at the end of last calendar year. And um, we'll go over the accomplishments for the latest quarter and the performance metrics and work that you directed us to do in April. And we're reporting back on how we can incorporate equity into the performance measures for the Envision Santa Cruz. So just as a quick reminder, our focus areas for the next 12 to 18 months are fiscal sustainability, downtown and business revitalization, and infrastructure. As far as the accomplishments, uh, so this covers the period of uh, through June 30th, and that would be the end of our fiscal year 21. So on the fiscal sustainability front, uh, you all passed some impact fees at the end of uh, the last fiscal year, and those became effective July, June 28th of 2021. So fiscal sustainability has various departments looking at development fees as well as fuller cost recovery. This was an area that you all worked with the departments on, and just with those becoming effective in June 28th, it was just a few days of being live and that brought in 7,000 in revenue. So that will continue to um, keep pace and bring revenue in that's much needed. Um, regarding uh, fiscal sustainability and being, and being more effective in the way that we process different uh, applications in our planning and community development department, they focused on a, a few different application processes and those uh, improvements that they've done will reduce our processing time and for, from one to two weeks for each one of those application types. On the grants writing front, we have a project being led out of the city manager's office, and that is to take a more holistic citywide view of the way that we pursue grants and grant funding and coordinate those more effectively. And we uh, currently have finished a questionnaire with all of the departments at the grant writing consulting firm is leading and then we will be to you hopefully in the September timeframe with the roadmap that the consult consultants recommend as far as grants in the city of Santa Cruz. And then finally, we passed uh, some code compliance update fees from planning and community development and uh, those went into effect at the end of June and they are in the process of rolling those out and once those go live, we'll be seeing some updated fees that we'll be able to recover. In the downtown and business revitalization section, some of the highlights are uh, the downtown expansion plan. So the consultant with the planning and community development department went out for RFP, they hired the consultant and that project will actually launch in August. Among other programs, economic development continues to heavily support our uh, small businesses and our, and our unique uh, local uh, 
businesses in the city and they have a downtown pops specific program that focuses on vacant commercial space in our downtown area. They had 15 applicants and you'll be starting to see those uh, spaces occupied in the near future as those applicants are rewarded and the lease is established. Uh, planning and development is working on single room occupancy and small ownership units uh, to be able to help uh, our affordable housing availability in our community. And then the Pacific Station North project being led by economic development, 100% affordable housing project. Uh, they've uh, hurdled, they've completed three additional process hurdles. Uh, the Olympics are going through my mind and I'm very distracted on those. It's very exciting to be able to watch those. I kind of miss them every night. Uh, so, but they're making really strong progress on Pacific Station North as well. On the infrastructure front, uh, we have a pre-apprenticeship program that, they're, that we are working on with the County Board of Education and they're in the process of getting that put together so we can launch that. Uh, for water infrastructure funding, they're working with an, the inspection agency funding availability to be able to bring in some funds for the various water infrastructure projects we have going. The Green Jobs Initiative, there was one session that was happening and there's another session at the end of August, so we'll be able to make some progress on that front. Additionally, Climate Action 2020 is wrapping up. Uh, Dr. Tiffany Wise-West out of the City Manager's Office has launched Climate Action 2030 with the community with various outreach meetings, so that's in process as well. And for the rail segment, segment uh, eight and nine, uh, they are in process with various design and env environmental review steps. The full uh, narrative report on the accomplishments through June 30th are in attachment one in your um, binders and online in our agenda management system. As far as the metrics, if you'll recall our metrics uh, lag by one quarter, so instead of ending uh, June of 2021, we're at the end of March of 2021 with our metrics. Some highlights from the full metric support that's in attachment to our commercial vacancy rate is down, so we are seeing the impact of the um, economic development work with our business, and then hopefully there'll be future additional positive impacts, especially as the downtown pops applicants come into fruition and those spaces get occupied. On the utility termination side, which is the way that staff um, ended up trying to look more accurately at uh, various commercial uh, businesses uh, going out, uh, it's the, the, those terminations are down 12%, which that's a, that's a good positive indicator for our community. In the transient occupancy tax base, we have uh, an about 5% improvement compared to the previous quarter's year-to-date totals. But tax and admission tax, we are still struggling and we did not see improvement from this quarter year-to-date compared to the previous quarter year-to-date. But because this ends in March, we are not seeing the impacts of the opening in June. So in the next two quarters, hopefully we'll see a positive impact on sales tax and ad tax. And with the Delta variant uh, in process in our community and around the world, we're going to have to see what happens and how that impacts um, the various masking requirements and other uh, limitations that could affect the reopening of our economy. This is um, two high level uh, indicators that we graph every quarter is the commercial vacancy. We hit a, a peak of vacancy in the second quarter. This gray one is fiscal year 21. D blue is fiscal year 19. Orange is fiscal year 20. So you'll see we hit a peak. Hopefully that is the peak and we're starting to go down. So hopefully we'll see a continued downward trend on the vacancies as businesses ramp back up and uh, the programs that ED is putting in place come to fruition. The sales, as I mentioned, this is especially one that lags by at least a quarter. June, the June 15th California wide opening is not reflective. So we're seeing the sales tax revenue stay about static for this quarter to last quarter and the previous. The other aspect in this uh, agenda report that you directed us to look at in April 
is uh, Dr. Tiffany Wise West, who as part of her um, overall duties, leads health and all policies from the staff side. So she's been working with the department to report in the metrics every quarter to back to all of you to see how we integrate equity into the performance measures that you identified and you identified them for us to track for our uh, interim recovery plan. So they've been analyzing them in attachment four. You'll see the list of performance measures that they're recommending that we focus on for an equity lens. The next step that they'll need to do is drilling down further on those identified performance metrics and figuring out um, can we get the underlying equity data associated with them. So that'll be that be able to report progress back to you on that work in the next quarter. They did do some research um, with um, the work of other jurisdictions, but um, we're, we're kind of ahead of the learning curve in this regard as far as the performance measures and getting the uh, detailed equity data as it relates to a strategic plan. So um, they quite frankly didn't find much of use. So we're charging some new territory here and uh, they're gonna look away at it and dive down into details on that data and get back to all of you. That is the five minute quick summary of re-envision Santa Cruz and what's been going on in the last quarter. Um, the recommended action for you today is to accept the second quarterly progress report on the Cruz or 12 to 18 month interim recovery plan and provide feedback as desired. Departments are available for questions as well um, because they know their accomplishments and the amazing projects they've been working on. So uh, we've got various folks on the line for questions, should you have them. And with that, Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Laura. You're welcome. Are there questions from council members on the report so far? Council Member Brown. I thank you. Uh, thank you for the update and um, looking forward to getting more info when the next quarter uh, um, totals come in. I didn't see the uh, the Metro Station South project uh, listed here, and I'm just wondering, uh, I'm glad to hear that we're making progress, and I, I we've been getting updates about that all along, but um, I'm just wondering if there was anything to update us on that piece of the project, that South End, um, and I see Bonnie Lipscomb here, so I'm guessing that's for you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mayor Brown, I mean, uh, Council Member Brown, and uh, good afternoon, Mayor and members of Council. Um, we do have some updated information. It's a reporting period that this report is on. Um, however, I, I will mention that um, we received a favorable ranking um, in uh, some of our tax credit rounds. So we are um, anxiously awaiting a letter later this month on Tax Station South. And right now we're on the eligibility ranking to be funded. So, you know, fingers crossed on Tax Station South, it, it will be huge for us um, if that does happen. Um, but, uh, you know, there are very competitive projects. We're also, because of the, the size of our county, um, you know, there, there are some, some uh, you know, a variety of projects countywide um, that are competing in the same tax round. It's always a very competitive process, but right now we are looking really good. Um, and then we also, um, which will be in the next reporting period on Tax Station North as well, as far as some of the infrastructure grants that we applied for and uh, meeting some eligibility thresholds. So we're continuing to make progress on um, securing funding for both Tax Station South and Tax Station North. That's great. Thank you so much for the update and all of your work. Thank you. Any Thank other you, questions? Bonnie. From council members on this? Uh, I had a couple of questions. Um, I just wanted to thank the staff. Um, it's not very, I don't feel like in the time I've been on the city council to have a one pager to really get of a variety of different activities that the city's engaged in. Um, it's really helpful this, this metric uh, kind of attachment to kind of shows the metrics um, performance metrics. I think it's kind of a cool way to just get a sense of what's happening with our economy, 
um, the kinds of building, you know, what's going on with people building the applications, TOT, all of that. Um, uh, that information is either, you know, it's really hard to find that information. So I appreciate, um, you know, Laura, your ability to kind of figure out how to convey this in a really very uh, easy snapshot that's easy to um, to kind of understand more, um, you know, in a, in a very quick kind of glance, which is great. Um, I had a question about the general fund performance metrics. Um, it looks like it's down about 27%. I just wanna make sure I'm understanding what that means exactly. Um, so this is the budgeted year end fund balance. It looks like um, that's showing that reduction. And is that, that's reflective of basically the reserves that we've had to use that we brought into our, basically our operating budget to offset the losses for COVID and the losses in revenue, correct? Correct, and um, this one, that one is an annual number, so it's not, we, we're not going to change that um, throughout this reporting period until we have an updated budget come through for fiscal year three. That's why uh, we noted the annual on that, because okay, it's, it's a static yeah. number that we don't plan to update every quarter. So that's about, just under, it's not 6 million, it's about 5.2 million. So that reflects the adjustments that have been made over the last fiscal year in order to pull from the reserves to, to, to make that operational budget work without without any further layoffs or anything like that. Okay, that's what I, right. I just wanted to under, understand. I wasn't quite sure the word annual. I was and then every, to... yep, in every budget um, cycle, the finance director will bring back to your attention the general fund reserve target that they have and how we're doing in relationship to that. Obviously due to the pandemic and the CZ Lightning Complex fire, we we use those so-called rainy day funds as we were supposed to. That's why we create those rainy day fund reserves, but we did use them. We lowered them and depleted them and we're going to have to build them back up in preparation for ongoing other disasters or things that might hit us financially. Okay. And then I had, that's great. Um, the other question I had was um, emissions tax. It looks like it's still lagging. Is that, um, I mean, this goes through end of June, right? So Boardwalk was still sort of kind of under operating. It looks like we only brought in down by like 96%. Yeah, I'm assuming and that this the one actually is through the end of March. So missing April, May, and June. Okay. So it probably won't be for another quarter even after that that we'll see the impact of the California wide opening. So we're probably looking at six months before we see ad tax. Okay, go up. that makes sense. Okay, yeah, that's right. This is just through June or through March. Okay, great. Yep. And then, um, I just was wondering, I was hoping that um, with the news that um, we receive the funding for um, the homeless work, maybe there's a way to tuck that as something to track um, under this, maybe under infrastructure, because I would imagine a lot of that will hopefully boost our ability to invest in some infrastructure for the future. Um, but I just was curious on where we might tuck that outcome, because I think it will be something people will be interested in sort of watching us track in terms of the recovery model that we've built. So just curious about your thoughts on where we might be able to track that in terms of this kind of reporting. I think for um, these California specific homelessness fund that Senator Laird have helped us get as well as the federal American recovery funding, uh, those are probably a little bit different as far as how we deploy those resources and the uses of those funds. So um, we will need to, based upon what is currently going on with the Delta variant and our financial situation right now, I think what we will need to be doing and um, the city manager's office will work with the finance and other department heads to be able to go back, re-update our forecast model and come back with with a financial update to the council sooner rather than later. We don't intend to wait until our normal mid-year update in February 
So we're going to be um, starting that process with the departments and be able to give of what month we'll be able to report back with the current financial situation. And I think in that we should report back on the homelessness funding as well as the American Recovery Act funding. Both of those sets of funds, the American Recovery as well as the homelessness, we are still figuring out the parameters for use. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of bulletins coming out. There's tons of webinars still happening. American Recovery Act, we're still finding out how, what limitations, how we can use them, can we use them for the $21 billion revenue shortfall over the last two fiscal years? You know, what uses can we do it? And the same is happening with um, the California homelessness funding. We're still trying to figure out what the parameters for use are around that. So it's kind of a work in progress then? Correct. Okay, great. And then my last question was, um, did you actually, um, did you want, um, uh, I noticed the draft equity indicator recommendations, did you want any kind of council to, uh, um, sort of direction on that? Or, um, I, you know, I read it, I thought it was, I think you guys are on the right track. Is that something you would come back with a little more formal? Here's where we landed or what kind of, what kind of feedback could we give you that today if anybody wanted to do that? We're obviously open to any specific feedback from the council today, but based upon the direction in April, we're we're basically marching along the path of um, taking the next steps that we outlined in this agenda report. We identified the performance measures that we think lend themselves to equity, and that those departmental leads that work on these performance measures will be working with Tiffany and Ralph out of the city manager's office to drill down and figure out, can we get to the data in these ones that we recommended, and then continuing to report back to you on progress. So we'll, we'll inherently do that based upon the, the April direction that we, re, we received. Okay, thank you. Council Member Thank you, that, that was one of my questions as I had some um, comments. And first of all, thank you for that report. That was um, an incredible amount of work um, and, and a very, very um, trying time. Um, but I did have some feedback on the equity indicators and didn't know when it was appropriate to provide that. So it sounds like at a, at a later time or directly with staff. You could, I, I would imagine give comments today if, yeah. Okay. So, so is now the appropriate time or do we wanna take it to public comment first? Uh, we could take it out the public comment. Uh, if I'm like, yeah, yeah, and then. Oh wait, okay. Oh wait, I just had some um, general feedback on on the equity indicators and the grant consultants. So I'll wait. Thank you. Okay. Great. Any other questions from council members at this point? Okay. I'll take it out to the public now. This is agenda item number 28, which is the. Um, uh, Quarterly, second quarterly progress report on the city's re envisioned Santa Cruz strategy. Uh, are there any members of the public that are looking to make comments on this? I'm not seeing any hands. If you are interested, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. If you're interested in commenting on this today. Okay, I'm not seeing any. I'll take it back to council and I'll go back to council member Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you. Um, so really impressed with all the amazing work and having it packaged in this way is so helpful to see um, in the framework that we're working within everything that's happening. So thank you to Laura and um, everyone who's worked on this. Um, so sort of questions, comments on the grant consultants. I'm really, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the strategic plan that um, the consultants are putting together. A um, couple of thoughts. I, I don't know how much we can um, provide input to the consultants, but um, making sure that there's pieces where we have cross um, alignment across departments, the departments talking to each other as we are um, planning for how to pursue grants. Because um, I think if we align and we work together across departments, greater opportunities. And then similarly, cross jurisdiction and cross sector. So partnering with um, other jurisdiction in our community and, and um, community-based organizations and, and public departments, I think will be will open up more doors. Um, and, and hopefully we will look at, I saw the note in there that we're, um, we'd consider future um, 
scopes with these consultants to help with uh, specific grant proposals. I hope that we will go in that mm -hmm. direction because I know it can be really, really difficult for um, staff who are, you know, boots on the ground getting their work done to um, apply to these grants. So those are just some comments on the grant pieces, but really, really excited to see that moving forward. And then the equity indicators, um, really, really great um, set of suggestions. Um, a couple of thoughts. I'm glad we're looking at disaggregating the data by age, gender, and ethnicity. Um, wondering if we can uh, consider sexual orientation as part of the disaggregated data. Um, I think um, we all know that LGBTQ community um, often has um, experiences uh, inequities um, beyond some other subpopulations in our community. So I'd like us to consider looking at sexual orientation as well. Um, and then um, let's see, how do I package this? So, so I, I'm not going to go into the weeds, but um, if there's an opportunity for some of the indicators, there's an opportunity to look at youth indicators as well. Um, just some examples are youth consuming fruits and vegetables, childhood obesity rates, binge drinking, youth mental health. And, and I can follow up directly with Tiffany um, or whoever else is appropriate, but um, I think for some of the adult indicators that we're looking at, uh, it would be great to have the youth indicators as well. And I think they're pretty readily available through existing systems. And then a question about, um, I noticed that some data is not, um, is not available through data share. So how do we, how do we approach that without putting the burden on the city? And how can we, this, is, this isn't a question for you, Laura, this is just a question for us to think about. Um, how can we just w work with data share or community assessment projects and the data gathering entities to make sure that um, the data we're looking at, they're also looking at and they're able to capture? Because those are the entities with expertise in data collection and we're hopefully just pulling that data for our purposes. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, it's, it's, it's out of the scope of the city to collect this level of data. Mm -hmm. So um, how can we work with the community experts who are doing this to uh, ensure that what we're doing is aligned with what they're doing and we're, we're collecting the data that's needed for the whole community, frankly? Because um, I think these equity indicators are relevant across our county. So again, a question that doesn't necessarily have an answer, but just for us to think about. Um, so those are my comments. Great. Thank you so much for the work. Thank you, Thank you. Council Member. Uh, regarding the grants consulting, uh, one of the key things that we are trying to figure out is that integrated view um, because we do tend to silo within our departments and that was one of the key drivers of why we went out to hire a consultant. And um, so we will definitely follow up on that, not just integrated across city departments, but other jurisdictions and other sectors. Um, the other thing, this is the first, what we view as a potential phase of work. We wanted to work with a consultant to put together a roadmap and then follow up as far as do we use the consulting firm to increase the city's capacity to be able to apply for grants. Um, the other huge issue that we run into as a city with our limited staff availability is once we get a grant or as we apply for grants, we have to look at the back end and the administrative support that's needed for that grant, the reporting requirements, those could end up really burdening an agency unless you look ahead of it and say, okay, we're gonna have to do X, Y, Z for two years as funds. So working with the company to understand that, but also potentially getting capacity in that regard from them. Um, regarding the equity indicator work, we, we will continue, we'll integrate your thoughts into that. Um, Tiffany will work with the department leads um, following that. And I think the unanswerable question that you asked, I mean, this is, this, is, this is the work of the core and the RFP process. This is the work of all the other agencies you see changing the way that they go about doing their business and looking at additional ways to imbue equity into a recruitment process, into the, the way that we deliver services. So as I think the global village of, of how we go about conducting ourselves on a day-to-day -day business changes, then the data starts to get captured and, and the systems 
be they process our actual IT systems begin to catch up with us, right? So, so it'll happen and um, it, it's moving along, but probably not at the pace that we want. Great, thank you, Laura. You're welcome. Council Member Watkins. I'll, I'll keep my, my comments short, but since um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson brought up the data, I wanted to chime in and um, just also thank Laura for um, really talking about holistically how an or as an organization in, in, in our entirety, um, when thinking about equity can incorporate that in all aspects of what we do, and that is ultimately what Health and All Policies is about. So I just get really excited and I just really appreciate that. <laughs> But I think you brought it up too, like core for sure is measuring impact, right? And community well-being. So how are we as we do to core thinking about the alignment with that? Um, there's a number of other sources, particularly around youth in terms of the Chick survey and the Gallup surveys that the schools are doing, and I'm happy to be a resource for you. Um, and then just briefly in terms of what I think I heard you say around the grant process, I fully understand the rationale. And I think, you know, ultimately just going back to what is the broader impact of that resource to go towards, right, in terms of the cost benefit analysis and sort of thinking about, okay, yeah, there will be a lot of um, maybe administrative overhead and costs and outputs, but if the impact is greater, then, um, then how are we kind of measuring and kind of factoring that in? But anyway, just a few thoughts on that, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, with that, um, we will just uh, look for a Mayor, motion. Mayor, sorry to interrupt. I, I got an email from a member of the public that they tried raising their hands, but it doesn't, it didn't work. So if we can go back and hear from Garrett Phillips. Sure. Garrett, if you could uh, go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. And we're not, so Garrett, press star six to unmute yourself, please. Uh, okay. I'll get one second here. Okay, I'm back here. Um, yeah, I, I was trying to raise my hand. It didn't recognize me as being uh, as having raised my hand, which is unusual. Anyway, uh, I'm start here. Uh, a sneaky systemic globalist leftism has infected the entire city's politic known as health and all policies are high up. You must think councils of the past operated with delusional thinking, how they could possibly openly debate, consider all factors, make incremental progress decisions based on the merits using American principles without being handcuffed by Marxist leftist policy filters, assuming all disparities come from victimization. Well, the people never voted on adopting the radical redefinition of the equity term, implying injustice and everything, and the left this so-called data-driven policies high up prioritizes are not science or city business, but Marxist leftist social statistics subject to fraudulent assumptions of causation easily manipulated into poor justifications for really bad law. This item, as the rental data collection idea does, proposes to expend resources collecting personal information using any means, I assume, leverage on the public to obtain irrelevant private personal information in a witch hunt for probably then misdiagnosed disparities to justify equity diversity quotas of which monetary redistribution theft and discrimination by city government via HIAP may be the result. As examples, HIAP is responsible for the systemically racist cannabis licensed qualification ordinance, which discriminates against white people. Similarly, the development impact fee illustrates the data logic abuse of HIAP saying, looky here, kids live in bedrooms, developers build bedrooms, therefore developers must owe childcare fees. No, actually that's just plain kooky pay to play extortion, like two plus two equals five, it's an equation, it must be true, pay me or else. HIAP totally ignores the limited purpose of city government, what other factors produce different life outcomes and is loaded with assumptions of leftist defined optimizations, supposedly needing social justice warring with the public monies. I must have missed any reference to helping restore the small businesses the government forced out of business or helping landlords recover government forced rent damages, but see plenty of references to the usual unchecked leftism. Thanks. I'll bring it back to council and look for a motion to accept uh, the quarterly report from the interim recovery plan. Council member Watkins followed by council member I, I will make the motion, but I just have one last thought that I forgot to mention, which was in regards to some of the data conversation that came up at the community meeting for 
um, the Black Lives Matter mural of vandalism. There was conversation around data and wanting to collect data, and I think whatever efforts um, we move forward with in that way, we have is um, complementary or um, tangential to this, to this work too. Um, so that was just one last comment before. Um, I'm happy to move the recommendation to um, and make a motion to accept the second quarterly progress reports on the city's we envision Santa Cruz strategy at 12 to 18 months interim recovery plan. And um, I'll leave it at that. The report should be on screen five. And Councilmember Contour Johnson. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to second. Great. So we have a motion to accept the second quarterly progress report on the uh, city's re envision Santa Cruz strategy. And Bonnie, could we do a roll call vote? Mm -hmm. Council Member Watkins? Aye. <clears throat> Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cumming? Aye. Council Member Golder is absent. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We're now going to move on to. Sorry? Oh, just thank you. Thank you, Laura. We're now going to move on to item number 30. Again, we're going to be moving item number 29 to after item 31. Item number 30 is the establishment of four additional city sister city subcommittees. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. And so I'll go ahead and turn this over to Rachel Kaufman, our recreation uh, superintendent. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Mayor Myers and city council members, Rachel Kaufman, recreation superintendent and staff liaison to the sister cities committee. Um, I bring today's item uh, before council uh, per council policy 15 point, I'm sorry, 5.12 titled advisory body standing subcommittees, which states that city council approval must be obtained by an advisory body to establish a standing subcommittee within six months of its establishment. And at the March 8th Sister Cities Committee meeting, committee members voted unanimously to approve the addition of four standing subcommittees to assist with the work of the Sister Cities Committee and the subcommittees for each city. So currently the Sister Cities um, Committee has a subcommittee for each active sister city. So this is Shingu, Japan, Sestri, Levante, Italy, Alustra, Ukraine, and Hinotepe, Nicaragua, and now the Friendship City of Bites, France. Uh, Puerto La Cruz, Venezuela is inactive at this time, and the subcommittee is not currently meeting. So the focus of each of the additional standing subcommittees would be one, um, coordination, identifying and engaging relevant stakeholders um, in various sister city, sisters, sister organizations and maintaining a data, database for all subcommittees. The second would be fundraising. So this committee would focus on um, creating a strategic grant program, identifying grant sources and applying for grants. The third is marketing, which is supporting the communication needs of each subcommittee and the fourth is youth engagement, identifying, recruiting, and engaging um, representatives of high school and college students to be involved in the Sister Cities program. And the Sister Cities Committee felt that the creation of these additional standing subcommittees with a specific focus would help the individual Sister Cities subcommittees move their initiatives forward um, and be better organized and access resources. Um, and so while the city staff recommends the approval of the four additional standing subcommittees to assist with the work of the committee, we did want to clarify with the city council that city staff can provide only such support as to ensure compliance with the Brown Act. So this would include posting agendas and terms of the standing subcommittees, but we don't have the staffing to attend the meetings, take minutes or create agendas. 
Um, and according to the sister cities bylaws, city staff shall normally not be required to attend or provide support for standing or ad hoc committees unless directed by the department head. And while we wish we could provide more support, um, I just feel this detail is important to note as the two areas within the Parks and Recreation Department that provide support to the Sister Cities Program, the Administrative Division and the Special Events um, area, both sustained budget cuts in last year's budget reductions. And so, um, you know, the Administrative Division had a 23% reduction in its staff, uh, temporary staffing, and the area of special events had um, cuts to both temporary and programmatic um, budgets. So therefore, when we recommend the approval of these standing subcommittees, we just do so with the understanding um, that city staff really has that ability to provide support to be in compliance with the Brown Act just due to this reduction in the staffing levels. Um, so I'm happy, you know, that's uh, my report and our recommendations. I'm happy to answer any questions and also have the current chair of the Sister Cities uh, Committee, Doug Hall, available to answer questions, um, as well as, of course, Parks and Recreation Director Tony Elliott is available as well. So thank you. And back to you, Mayor Myers. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, are there questions from City Council members on this? Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you, Rachel uh, and Doug. Hello. Uh, I was curious. My question was that if the uh, Sister Cities Committee was very clear in that understanding with the staff report, the staff support uh, not being available in in the way that they might want it to be for these subcommittees? Hi, <clears throat> yes, we're very, very clear. Um, yes, I'm sorry. We're very, very clear on the fact that um, staff support is uh, compliance with the Brown Act and eventual help with special events. The intent and the uh, guideline that we're following is that all of the new um, events that we are planning uh, are going to be self-funded and completely um, self-directed. So we are recruiting and the main reasons for justifying these standing committees is to uh, beef up the personnel, the um, resources in um, human power to uh, actually execute the um, the plans that we're putting uh, that we're putting together. Uh, for example, fundraising, we've um, gotten two grants um, and uh, some more as a result of that next year. Uh, we're, we, we've recruited some uh, really high level um, videographers as well as uh, faculty uh, from both UCSC and um, Cabrillo College. So. What's going on is that we've, we're um, increasing momentum and energy, and as a result of that, more people are we're recruiting and keeping all of that um, directed in such a way that uh, staff is not called upon in, in any way, purely on an administrative function. Wonderful. Thank you. That answers my question. Welcome. I had a, a similar question myself, so thank you for that. Um, is there any other questions by council members on this? I am not seeing any. Okay. Uh, I will go ahead and take this out to public comment then. So this will be for item number 30, which is the establishment of four additional sister city subcommittees. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. If you're in commenting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. Looking at uh, our folks here in the attendees list, and I'm not seeing any hands coming up. So ahead and bring this back to city council for further deliberation or for a motion. Uh, Councilmember Brown. 
thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Hull for being here and thank you, um, Ms. Kaufman for providing uh, a little bit of an intro. I just wanted to make a couple of comments about the Sister Cities Committee and the work you do. You know, we we rely on our advisory bodies to, you know, to advise us on uh, all manner of city business. And um, in this case, I feel like, you know, the Sisters, the Sister Cities Committee is, is just, you know, full of energy and, you know, all of the work that you do is, it really, really makes program so wonderful. It's just phenomenal work you do um, and you do it as volunteers and you stay organized um, and on task. And, you know, we've just seen this, you know, year after year in, in the inter, in, in interchanges, I was going to say intercambial, um, the um, exchanges that are, are done between students and um, so, um, and, and others from those communities or sister cities. So I just, I just really think you do amazing work and I'm happy to move the rec to approve your uh, request to uh, add four standing subcommittees of the Sister Cities Committee and, and wish you uh, luck and lots of uh, time to, <laughs> to, to do that additional work that you're willing to take on. I so appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member. We have a motion by Council Member Brown. And next I have Council Member Colantari Johnson with her hand up. Great, thank you. And I can go ahead and um, also just wanted to comment. Uh, thank you for the the work and the presentation, um, youth engagement. I'm, I'm really happy to see that piece in there and just wanted to comment that um, I'm working with council members Watkins and Golder, um, as well as with Parks and Rec staff and city manager staff on how to really look at youth engagement across the board of what we do um, with our city committees and commissions and how to integrate youth voice in city decision for us to just stay connected with what the sister cities committee is doing, um, just to make sure that we're, we're all aligned and, and, and looking at youth engagement and youth voice in the same way. Thank you. Thank you, council member. We have a motion and a second. And is there further comments? I see Vice Mayor Bruner. I just wanted to comment. Uh, thank you, Doug. Paul, and thank you to the entire Sister Cities Committee um, for, it's just wonderful to see the, the energy and the engagement and the level of commitment and, um, um, you know, the, the, the promotion of that educational and cultural exchange is so vital in um, everything that we do. So thank you so much. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay, we have a motion to um, approve the addition of four stand committees for the Sister Cities Committee. A motion by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Collintar Johnson. And we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Collintar Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. <clears throat> Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. I skipped um, Councilmember Boulder is absent and Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you and thank you for, for being here, Mr. Hull, as well. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, next we will move on to item number 31, which is... Resolution adopting a military surplus acquisition policy for all city departments. And remember who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council, excuse me, for deliberation and action. Uh, the presenter on this item will be Andy Mills, our uh, Chief of Police. Hi, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Myers, and uh, good afternoon, as well as City Council members. It's good to see you and present this item. As you may recall, this is a follow-up item from November 24th of 2020, when Council uh, approved 24 different 
This is one of them, and it was to uh, come up with a policy that counts that would demand that any type of military acquisition would come before council uh, prior to its acquisition uh, for allocation of money, even if it was free. So this is the follow-up to that. In, in your packet, you had a, uh, as well as a, staff, a very short staff report. And essentially what it, uh, it says, the city council believes that limiting the receiver acquisition of surplus military equipment by all departments, including police and fire, is one of the first and foremost visible steps necessary to create a safer city for all people in Santa Cruz and to be as a trusted partner to all people. There are three real essential elements of this. The first is without receiving prior approval of a budget amendment from the city council and such budget amendment shall request in writing, explain the need for the surplus military property and explain the specific purposes of such property. I might remind council that there are many types of property uh, that can be acquired uh, from the 1033 and 1122 programs, such as boats, aircraft, um, I don't think we need any helicopters right now, but in case we do in the future, we could probably go to that program, uh, as well as even physical pieces of property such as desks and first aid equipment. So there's a lot of different types. All this would do is demand that if in any department, whether it's police, fire, or, uh, or public works, we would need to submit to council in writing an acquisition uh, to add to the budget. Um, it also prohibits uh, the police department or any other department from accepting as a donation property from the surplus military equipment without requesting and receiving prior city council the council resolution. And then the third piece of this, I think is just as important, and that is that with the whatever department acquires any military equipment, they would need to report out to council to the public safety committee once a year uh, what the, uh, the presence of the equipment, what the equipment was used for, and uh, so that there is some accountability uh, for the department using that piece of equipment. And that's essentially what this uh, ordinance says. I certainly would be happy to answer any questions that you might have concerning uh, the resolution. Thank you, Chief. Are there members of the uh, uh, city council that have questions right now for Chief Mills? Councilmember Brown. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Chief Mills, for bringing this forward and moving moving forward with the, um, the policies that we looked at, uh, or the whole suite of policies uh, that we looked at last year. Um, so I have a question, you know, again, this is very general and, you know, I didn't see specification about what types of equipment might be considered. And you mentioned a few just now, probably some of the more high profile ones, um, but it is kind of hard to envision what types of requests the council might see moving forward. Um, and so I'd just be interested to hear more of your thoughts on that. And, and if you have any thoughts on wh whether it might be prudent to, have some additional guardrails on, you know, what what the city would consider acceptable um, military equipment. It just seems it's very it's very general, and I, I recognize that the intention is to give the city council um, authority to make those decisions when they um, if and when they come before us. Um, but just to kind of think about the parameters a little bit would be would be helpful, or how you envision it, I guess. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, first of all, we don't have any uh, surplus equipment from the military. Uh, we have not applied for any in many, many years. It's not just my administration, but it's even before that, we did not really apply for any uh, 1033 or 1122 equipment. Um, it was purposely written broadly uh, so that it would prohibit all uh, access to that any equipment. That way it gives council the ability to um, to take a look at that equipment and block it uh, should it come forward to you in the future uh, based on what the current representatives believe is the um, will of, this, of the greater community. Uh, the second piece of that is there are literally tens of thousands of different types of equipment that can be acquired. And so to develop an ordinance that would list out in detail 
um, all the types of equipment from night vision goggles to helmets to shields to uh, chemical, radio, radiological, biological uh, suits to you name it. Um, it would be pretty onerous to, to list all of those and to go through them for you. So I'd much rather give council the broader um, authority uh, and then um, so that any department, whatever, whoever it is, would need to come to you before they acquire that equipment. Thank you. I, I I wouldn't suggest that uh, we try to get any detailed list of, of those, um, what, what that equipment might look like. I'm just thinking there's a very broad range. So, you know, from first aid kits to, you know, um, pretty pretty serious technologies. Um, so I, I understand the, the desire to have this be general, and I think it makes sense to operationalize it. Um, and I appreciate your bringing this to us today. Thank you, council members. Are there any other questions or comments at this point? Chief Mills, I'm not seeing any. Okay, we'll move on to public comment on this item. Uh, we're now on agenda item number 31 for members of the, that is the uh, resolution adopting a military surplus acquisition policy for all city departments. Uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item, you want to comment on, now is the time to call in instructions on your screen. Uh, if you are interested in commenting, now would be the time to press star nine to raise your hand. And when I call on you, uh, you will hear an announcement that you will be unmuted. And I am not seeing any hands in the um, audience at this point, and our attendees. So I will go ahead and bring it back to council for um, additional, um, for either a motion or additional discussion. Council member Cummings. I just wanna start by thanking the police chief um, for bringing this back to us. I know many members of the community um, have expressed concern around our ability to, ex uh, to accept military grade equipment. And so um, adding that layer of having the council make to be able to weigh in, I think we'll, really allow for it to, to be a transparent process that will involve, um, you know, the, the council to actually weigh in when these types of equipment are accepted. And so I'm happy to move the um, item before us. Thank you, council member. And I have Vice Mayor Bruner. I will second that motion. Thank you. Great. Okay. Okay, and Council Member uh, Brown, did you have additional comments? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to, to make a, a quick comment here um, and just remind us all that the, the question that we're really being asked here is, do we support taking military grade equipment and, and using that, you know, and, and using that equipment in our city? And so, I, and I know that it's, there's a whole range and it, it can be quite complicated, but, I just want to say, and I support this uh, this policy, um, but I just want to say, you know, for the record, that I'm I'm opposed to the city getting involved in acquiring uh, military grade equipment. Kind of stances. I think that the move towards militarizing uh, local police forces is um, is problematic. And while we may not feel that it would play out in a problematic way in our community, it is kind of as a, as a general trend uh, nationally happening in local communities, something that I think we should be thinking about and, um, you know, and just recognize the, the challenges there and, you know, the, and what, that might, what might, that might mean for the city in the future. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Cummings? I had a quick question, follow-up question to Council Member Brown's point, and maybe if the police chief's still on, um, you can help answer this question. Um, I'm just wondering currently if a department wanted to acquire equipment from these programs, what's the current kind of protocol that they would have to go through? Well, one would have to log on to the, um, uh, to the official websites that would allow us to access that equipment, and then you request it, and then you would be able to acquire it free of charge. Um, there currently are no protocols in place, at least that I'm aware of in the city, that would require 
require me to do anything special, especially if it's in this money. I see the city manager logged on, so he may have a little bit more knowledge about that than I do. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I, I can't recall a, t a time where we've ever had any other department uh, consider any kind of military equipment. Uh, I don't think it's something that we generally look at or consider for really for anything. I think it's only come up in the context of, of, of police, uh, but otherwise uh, it just has not been something that we normally even look at or consider uh, for, for anything. So it's just never really been an issue. Thanks, and I, I guess I just want, because I, want, I just wanted to be clear to the community that this is actually kind of helping to address these concerns around, um, you know, the militarization of whether it's police or any other department accepting this equipment, it actually provides another layer of um, transparency that, the, that in order to accept this equipment, it actually needs to come to the council for approval so then the city council could weigh in on behalf of the people. So I think it, it is a really good step in the direction of trying to ensure that you know we're not accepting equipment that the community would be opposed to. Um, so um, I'll just leave and uh, look forward to moving forward. Thank you. We have a motion by Council Member Cummings and seconded by Vice Mayor Bruner uh, for adopting uh, a resolution, um, a res excuse me, for a resolution adopting a policy limiting the acquisition of military surplus equipment departments. And could we have a roll call, please? Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Councilmember Golder is absent. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That, um, sorry, I was getting a text from Councilmember Golder. Um, was, the member Brown vote no on that one? Or were you and I? You were and I. Okay, that's what I thought it was unanimous. Okay, that uh, motion passes unanimously. Okay, um, let's see here. Bonnie, um, Let's, if you guys don't mind, let's just take a five minute uh, break and we'll come back in. I'm just gonna give uh, Council Member Golder a call and see if she'll be able to make this next um, item. And then we'll have public, uh, and then we'll have oral communications immediately following that. So. We'll come back in at like 2.15, 2.16. Thanks everybody. I'll give her a call real quick. Council members can turn on their camera when we come back in, that would be great. I wanna make sure council member Golder is on. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Thank you. When council members come back in, if you could turn on your cameras here, we'll go ahead and get started. We're just missing two council members.
council members. Great. Everybody's here. Okay, good. For members of the public, we are now on agenda item number 29, which we're taking um, as our last item under general business. We moved it after uh, item number 31. Agenda item number 29 is an ordinance amending chapter 13.04.011 of the Santa Cruz Code related to Loudon London Nelson Community Center. Um, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn this over to Tremaine Hedden Jones uh, with our Parks Department. Hello, Tremaine. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and City Council. Uh, Tremaine has delegated this uh, to me today, so happy to, happy to present this item. Um, <laughs> so uh, following up on the, uh, just quickly for the record, Tony Elliott, uh, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, at the June 8th City Council meeting, the Council uh, adopted resolution number NS-29838, uh, affecting locations and landmarks honoring Loudon London Nelson uh, to change the name to London Nelson, specifically the London Nelson Community Center, uh, pursue a more accurate depiction of the history of Mr. Nelson, and three, to explore education efforts on Mr. Nelson's contributions to Santa Cruz. So um, in our effort uh, to um, make administrative uh, uh, edits or really cleanups to the municipal code, um, this item uh, before the council today will correct um, instances of the name Loudon uh, in our municipal code uh, to London. Uh, so it's that straightforward. Um, this is part of our effort and our commitment to make all of these updates and transitions and corrections uh, before the end of this calendar year. So this is part of that process to clean up that language. So uh, the proposal uh, before the council today is to hold first reading uh, on these amendments to uh, ordinance uh, chapter 13.04.011 um, and uh, updating a Loudon to, so happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Tony. Is there questions from any council members on this item? Not seeing any. Okay, I'll go ahead and move it to uh, out to the public. Uh, for those members of the public who are interested in speaking on item number 29, now is the time to call in using the instructions on this. If you are interested in commenting on item 29, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand at this point. I'm not seeing any hands raised, so I'll bring this back to um, our council for either further questions, deliberation, or a motion. Council member Cummings? I'm happy to move. Uh, the staff recommendation to introduce for publication an ordinance, an ordinance amending chapter 13.04.011 uh, related to historical corrections to the naming of the Loudon London Nelson Community Center. Is there a Vice Mayor Bruder? I'd like to second. Okay. Any additional questions or comments from council member on this? No, okay. We have a motion by council members, uh, excuse me, by council member Cummings, um, introducing for publication and amending chapters 13.04.011 related to the historic or historical corrections to the naming of Loudon London Nelson Community Center. Um, and uh, we have second by uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Can we do a roll call vote, please? Council member Watkins. Aye. Calendary Johnson. Aye. Brown. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Council member Golder. Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner. Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. 
And uh, again, Tony, thanks to everyone on your team for this effort and to um, all the council members involved. And yeah, really, really great effort. Thank you so much. Okay, next we have oral communications. Uh, and this is for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. It is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture it in the meeting minute. However, it is not required to state your name. Please remember, this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but we are, when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. Two hands in the public. Uh, I'll call on a phone number ending in 1810 uh, as our first speaker. Hi, it's time to admit you messed up backing a Marxist anarchist movement like the BLM and allowed painting their deceptive motto in front of City Hall, no less. I told you so they would produce violence, and the Marxist Malcolm X inspired BLM sure delivered prediction. After $5 billion in national damages destroying also the livelihoods of the very people they pretend to represent and innocent others, after dozens of murders, unaccountable assaults, arson, intimidation, and worse yet, convincing thousands of people that violence, rioting, looting, and shoplifting is now justified, necessary, and is now normalized. I say accept your judgment error and remove it, unless, of course, you actually agree with the National BLM organization headed by the likes of Melinda Abdullah, who idiotically calls for the abolition and dismantling of the entire criminal justice system. Yeah, sure, don't acknowledge crime skyrocketed in cities dumb enough to be intimidated by the BLM mob's defund police uh, demands, or that the BLM sided with the communist Cuba oppressing their own people, and perhaps the council members should stop reading and listen a little bit, or when the Paris Coolers now owns millions of dollars of real estate and won't open the books, or that the movement was founded on the lie of hands up, don't shoot, which never happened. The BLM is really dedicated to totally destroying both the justice system as well as our economic systems, because too many are Marxist anarchists who hate America or plain old violent extremist revolutionaries and will en enrage as much racial hatred as they can invent to achieve that destruction. Take a peek around the world, educating yourselves what happens when violence is normalized. It's kind of a similar situation to the glorification symbol of the vast collection of LGBT morals hung all over the Civic Center well beyond its stale date of June, which represents a very diverse moral system, not all of which is particularly by a great many, such as what some think of as sociopathic sluttiness of many gay men who engage in sex with hundreds to a thousand different lifetime sexual partners or some kinds of gender child abuse. I totally respect individual freedom, go for it, but the government has no business loudly promoting what they consider as moral or as well as promoting the anti-American violence politics of the BLM and should confine itself to just making and enforcing law. Thanks. Next, I have phone number ending in seven, yeah, seven six six two. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Douglas Beach, Pogona Foundation Inc., DBA Monterey Bay Conservancy. As you're probably aware, uh, the governor declared a groundwater emergency in Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Benito counties. Uh, of course, this should have actually been accomplished in 1998, and unfortunately, the supervisor from the third district, Marty Bornhout, voted against it at that time. If you would please go to pogonip.org forward slash ORD dot HTM, uh, you'll see the ordinance, the well ordinance that required emergency. Please see Judge Omquist's testimony, your opinion at that time, pogonip.org forward slash ALM dot HTM. For the last five years, I've been requesting at the State Water Resources Conservation Board uh, intervention in the whole Monterey Bay. As you probably also know, uh, uh, the Coastal Commission has uh, not projected, but wants everybody to plan for 3.5 feet in the next uh, 30 years. If you go to minute 541 at 
uh, let's say San Francisco real estate.com to see the preeminent real uh, water expert in the state of California, Dr. Mount, explaining what one foot of sea level rise will do. Uh, that type of sea level rise, one inch, will probably wipe out all of our coastal aquifers. Uh, we need to have DPR, uh, recycled water projects, and projects. Your injection projects are only going to average around uh, well, maybe eight or 9,000 feet of ASR over the year. Now, I have a project that you can see at dugdeach.info. It's called the Monterey Bay 21,000-acre Estuary National Monument, and it repurposes the 31,000-acre feet of recycled water from Castro Hill Reclamation Plant to uh, all the urban water uses that we needed in the Monterey Bay and eliminates all coastal pumps. I'll be happy to give you a presentation anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to us today? We've got phone number ending in 5362. Was that Mr. Deach? Bonnie, was that? No, this is someone else, I believe. Okay. Go ahead, please. Star uh, six to unmute yourself. Phone number ending in 5362. Hi, I just uh, walked back into the house. Is this oral communications? Yes, it is. Okay, hi. Uh, this is Judy Grunstra, and uh, welcome back to City Council members. I'd like uh, the council to direct Public Works to not reinstall size and ugly River Street sign. Those of you who lived here when it was installed probably remember the community's negative reactions. People may have gotten used to it, um, but the ro the road looks much better without it. And with so many people having GPS systems or um, other directional information available on their phones, the sign serves no real purpose to guide. I think you should recycle it, and you'll be doing residents and visitors a big favor. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 2853. Please press star six. Hi, um, Lyra Filippini. I just want to first thank each of you for coming and meeting with um, myself and neighbors um, from Belvedere Terrace. It really was um, a very meaningful gesture for us to be able to express our, our worries and concerns over a streamlined process at that particular location. Um, and then I wanted to thank um, Sonia, especially for mentioning um, that, that she would think it'd be a good idea for there to be a special meeting um, about SB 35 and its implications. And I think what would actually be very helpful for everybody, because I think everyone is um, nervous about, about this for our city, including you folks and um, the community and staff. Uh, I think it would be very helpful if we did have a special meeting that also discussed um, setting up the process so that we can look at are the avenues available to us to set a process that everyone can feel the most comfortable with um, and be able to have clear understanding about what that process will be um, then moving forward. And I'll just give you a little example. Um, the current application at that site, uh, the updated one does have the spreadsheet um, that the old one had that shows how the developer feels that he is abiding by the SB 35 guidelines. And considering there's a lot of um, very significant changes in the, the new application, um, it's very hard for the public to be able to go through and actually assess those, you know, changes against what he's considering to be uh, meant for our various objective standards because we don't have those actually formally set yet. So if you guys would be willing to consider putting that um, special meeting on the agenda coming up here soon, I think everyone would really appreciate that. I definitely would. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to us about on oral communications today? These are for items not on our agenda today. Please press star nine to raise your hand. Okay, not seeing any more. Uh, we will go ahead and was there a question, Council Member Cummings? 
Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had a, I just had a quick question regarding. Um, sorry, give me one second. Um, regarding one of the comments that was made, I'm just wondering, um, is there not, would there be the possibility for council to weigh in on the River Street sign going back in or the future of that sign, given that it's down and a lot of people have been, you know, asking the city to take that down. And I'm, I'm just wondering that since now the effort has gone into taking it down, whether we can vote on replacing it with something else moving forward. And I'm not sure if that's a question for the city manager or the city attorney, but um, it seems we're probably at a, a point where we can maybe uh, consider an alternative for, for that sign moving forward. I guess I can try to answer that. Uh, yeah. I, I, ultimately, I think it's up to the city council, but I think what I would do is uh, maybe uh, have a, a public works kind of look into it. I don't recall what all the sort of obligations are. And uh, so I, mean, I know there was a process in a plan that was put in place for that area that included the sign. So we can do a little bit of background and uh, check with public works and then bring it back if the council wants us to. So. Thank you, Marcy. Sure. Okay, uh, we've reached the uh, end of our uh, regular agenda. We do have uh, closed session agenda items. Those will start at 4.30 today and we will basically recess until that time. So again, we will have closed session items starting at 4.30 today. Uh, and until then, we will be in recess. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the 4.30 uh, p.m. public portion of the closed session of the August 10th, 2020. Take over for a few minutes. Yes, I can. Um, sorry, really quick. I just got a text from Shebra, and I need to recenter the link, so I don't know if you want to wait or... Yeah, why don't we wait for that? Um, let me just pop off a minute here. Okay, I can take over. Sonia, do you have the extended, or do you have the expanded agenda? I do. Okay. Give me about, All right. give me about five minutes once uh, Shepard's come on, I'll, I'll come back in. Okay, I can go ahead with the script. Um, Vice Mayor, do you know if uh, Council Member, oh, there's, there's Martine, that was. Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the 4.30 p.m. Oh, sorry, really quick. Sorry, really quick. Didn't, didn't the mayor want to wait for Shebra? Okay. Thank you for everyone's patience. We'll be starting shortly. Okay, I think you're all here. Okay, thank you.
Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the 4.30 p.m. public portion of the closed session of the August 10th, 2021 meeting of the City Council. If you would like to comment on a closed session item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is the delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I wanna thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meetings. I would like to ask the please call the roll. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Council members Watkins. Present. Kalantari Johnson. Here. Brown. Here. Cummings. Yeah. Boulder. Sorry, I forgot to unmute here. Vice Mayor Brunner. Present. And Mayor Myers. I'm back. Thank you, Vice Mayor, for opening the meeting. Uh, are there any uh, members of the public who would like to speak to any items listed on the closed session agenda? I'm seeing two people in the uh, audience if you're interested in speaking on the items on the closed session agenda. Uh, if you could please press star nine to raise your hand. I'm not seeing anyone raising their hand. Okay, so hearing none, this meeting is adjourned and the council will go into its closed session now. Bonnie, let us know when, and Laura, let us know when you're ready.